Nit grinned Parshuram. I meant no insult. I apologize. Why apologize, my lord? It is the truth. I was a bandit. Veerbhadra had become increasingly fascinated with this strange bandit. Intelligent, disturbed, and ferociously devoted to Shiva. He spoke up, changing the topic. You were delighted about General Parvateshwar and Princess Anandmai's wedding. I found that interesting. Well, they are completely different, said Parshuram. In terms of personality, thought, belief and region, actually pretty much everything. They are polar opposites, extremes of the Chandravanshi and Suryavanshi thought processes. Traditionally, they should be enemies, yet they found love in each other. I like stories like that. Reminds me of my parents. Shiva frowned. He remembered the terrible rumor he had heard about Parashuram beheading his own mother. Your parents? Yes, my lord. My father Jamadagni was a Brahmin, a scholarly man. My mother Renuka was from a Kshatriya clan. Rulers who were vassals of the Brangas. So how did they get married? Smiled Shiva. Due to my mother? Smiled Parshuram. She was a very strong woman. My parents were in love, but it was her strength of character and determination that propelled their love to this logical conclusion. Shiva smiled. She worked in his gurukul. That in itself was against the norm in her clan. How is working in a school a rebellion? Because in her clan it was prohibited for women to go out and work. They couldn't work? Why? I know that some clans have rules that do not allow women on the battlefield. Even the Gunas had that rule. But why against work in general? Because my mother's clan was amongst the stupidest on the planet, said Parshuram. My mother's people believed a woman should remain at home, that she shouldn't meet strange men. What rubbish, said Shiva. Absolutely. In any case, like I said, my mother was willful. And also her father's darling. So she convinced him to allow her to work at my father's gurukul. Shiva smiled. Of course, my mother had her own agenda, said Parshuram. She was desperately in love. She needed time to convince my father to give up his vows and marry her. Give up vows? My father was a Vasudev Brahmin. And a Vasudev Brahmin cannot marry. Other castes within the Vasudevs can, but not Brahmins. There are non-Brahmins amongst the Vasudevs? Of course. But Brahmins steer the community. To ensure that they remain true to the cause of the Vasudevs, they have to give up all earthly attachments like wealth, love and family. Therefore, one of their vows is that of lifelong celibacy. Shiva frowned. What is this obsession among the Indians about giving up earthly attachments? How in the Holy Lake's name can that guarantee that you will evolve into a better human being? So, continued Parshuram, his eyes crinkling, my mother finally convinced my father to break the rules. He was in love with her, but she gave him the courage to give up his Vasudev vows so he could spend his life with her. Even more, she also convinced her own father to bless their relationship. <laughs> like I said, when she wanted something, she made it happen. My parents got married and had five sons. I was the youngest. Shiva looked at Parshuram. You are really proud of your mother, aren't you? Oh, yes. She was quite a woman. Then why did you... Shiva stopped talking. I shouldn't have said that. Parshuram became serious. Why did I behead her? You don't have to speak about it. I cannot even imagine the pain. Parshuram took a deep breath, sliding down to sit on the deck. Shiva sat on his haunches, touching Parshuram on his shoulder. Veerbhadra stood, staring directly into Parshuram's pain-ridden eyes. You don't need to say anything, Parshuram, said Shiva. Parshuram closed his eyes, right hand over his heart. He chanted repeatedly, bowing to Lord Rudra in his prayer. <sighs> Om Rudraya Namaha. Om Rudraya Namaha. Shiva watched the Brahmin warrior quietly.
I have never spoken about it with anyone, my lord, said Parshuram. It was the trigger that set my life on a path it has taken. Shiva reached out and touched Parshuram's shoulder again. But I must tell you, if there is one person who can heal me, it is you. I had just completed my studies. Unlike my father, I too wanted to be a Vasudev. He didn't want me to. He didn't want any of his sons to become Vasudev. He had been expelled from their tribe when he had chosen to marry my mother. He didn't want any of us to suffer his fate in the future. Veerbhadra sat down as well, all ears for Parshuram's story. But I had my mother's doggedness in me. Unlike my brothers, I was determined. I thought I would enter the tribe of Vasudevs as a Kshatriya, as this way I wouldn't be bound by their detachment vows. I trained as a warrior. My father sent a letter to Ujjain, the Vasudev capital, to a few elders who still sympathized with him and requested them to consider my application. When the day finally arrived, I departed to the closest Vasudev temple for my examination. What did this have to do with his mother? What I didn't know when I left was that my grandfather had died. He was the only one holding back my mother's barbarian horde of her family. The moment his influence was gone, they decided to do what they always wanted to do. Honor kill. Honor kill? Parshuram looked at Shiva. When the people in the clan believe a woman in their community has insulted the honor of her family, the clan has the right to kill that woman and everyone else with her to avenge their loss of face. Shiva just stared, stunned. What honor can there be in this barbarism? The men of my mother's family, her own brothers and uncles, attacked my father's Gurukul. Parshuram stopped talking. A long, held-back tear escaped from his eyes. They... Parshuram held his breath and then found the strength to continue. They killed my brothers, all my father's students. They tied my mother to a tree and forced her to watch as they tortured my father for an entire day, doing unspeakable horrors. Then they beheaded him. Virbhatra squirmed. Unable to comprehend such insanity, such evil. But they didn't kill my mother. They told her that they wanted her to live. To relive that day again and again. That she had to serve as an example to the other women. So that they would never dare bring dishonor to their families. I returned to find my father's Gurukul destroyed. My mother was sitting outside our house, holding... My father's severed head in her lap. She looked like her soul had been burnt alive. Her eyes wide, blank. A shadow of the woman she had been, broken and brutalized. Parshuram stopped talking and turned to look at the river. This was the first time he was talking about his mother since that terrible day. She looked at me as though I was a stranger. And then she said the words that would haunt me forever. She said, Your father died because of me. It is my sin. I want to die like him. Shiva's mouth fell open in shock, his heart going out to the unfortunate Brahman. At first, I didn't understand. And then she commanded, Behead me. I, I didn't know what to do. I hesitated. Then she said once again, I'm your mother. I am ordering you, behead me. Shiva pressed Parshuram's shoulder. I had no choice. My mother was catatonic. Without my father's love, she was nothing but an empty shell. As I picked up my axe to carry out her order, she looked straight into my eyes. Avenge your father. He was the finest man that God ever created. Avenge him. Kill every single one of them. Every single one. 
Parshuram fell silent. Shiva and Virbhadra were too stunned to react. The only sounds were those of the somnolent waves of the Madhumati, breaking gently against the ship. I did as she said. I beheaded her, said Parshuram, taking a deep breath and wiping his tears. Then his eyes lit in remembered anger as he spoke through gritted teeth. And then I hunted down every single one of those bastards. I beheaded every single one of them. Every single one. The Vasudevs expelled me. I had killed people without the permission of their tribe, they said. Without a fair trial, they said. I had committed a wrong, they said. Did I, my lord? Shiva looked straight into Parshuram's eyes, his heart heavy. He could feel the Brahmin's intense pain. He knew that Lord Ram would have probably acted as the Vasudevs had. The great Suryavanshi would have wanted the criminals to be punished, but only after a fair trial. However, he also knew that if anyone had dared to do this to his own family, he would have burnt down their entire world. No. You didn't do anything wrong. What you did was in accordance with justice. Parshuram sighed as a dam burst. <sighs> what I did was just. Shiva held Parshuram's shoulder. Parshuram covered his eyes with his hand, sniffing. At long last he shook his head slightly and looked up. The Branga king sent bands of Kshatriyas to arrest me to apparently bring me to justice for annihilating his most important vassals. Twenty-one times they sent brigades to catch me, and twenty-one times I beat them. Finally they stopped. But how did you fight the Brangas alone? asked Virbhadra. I wasn't alone. Some angels knew of the injustice I had suffered. They brought me to this haven, introduced me to the few unfortunate, ostracized brigands who lived here. I could build my own army. They gave me medicine so that I could survive despite the unclean waters here and food till I had established my people in the forest. They gave me weapons to fight the Brangas. And all this without any expectations from me. The battles with Brangaridha were also brought to an end because they finally threatened the Branga king. And King Chandraketu could not refuse them. They are the best people amongst us all, angels who fight for the oppressed. Shiva frowned. Who? The Nagas, replied Parshuram. What? Yes, my lord. That is why you are looking for them, right? If you want to find evil, you must make the good your ally, right? What are you talking about? They never kill innocents. They fight for justice, despite the injustices they endure. They help the oppressed whenever and wherever they can. They truly are the best amongst us all. Shiva stared hard at Parshuram, not saying a word, completely staggered. You are looking for their secret, aren't you? Asked Parshuram. What secret? I don't know. But I have heard that the secret of the Nagas has a deep connection to evil. Isn't that why you are searching for them? Shiva didn't answer. He was looking into the horizon, deep in thought. It had been two weeks since the battle with the Liger's pride. All the injured soldiers were well on the path to recovery. But Ganesha's wounded leg had still not completely healed. Sati had been supervising the building of some defences at the Chavar village perimeter as a precaution against future animal attacks. She returned to the camp to see Kali changing the dressing on Ganesh's wound. Both Kali and Ganesh, perhaps encouraged by Sati's complete acceptance of their appearance, had not worn their masks for the last two weeks. The Chandravanshi soldiers, however, still averted their eyes in dread when they saw them. Kali had just finished applying the neem bandage. She patted Ganesh on his head and rose to walk towards the fire at one corner of the clearing. Sati saw the gesture and smiled. She turned to instruct Kavas to carry on with his work and walked up to Kali. How is his wound? It will take another week, Didi. 
the healing process has slowed down since last week. Sati grimaced, unhappy. The poor child has lost a lot of blood and flesh. Don't worry, said Kali. He is very strong. He will recover. Sati smiled. Kali threw the bandage into the fire. The paste on the bandage, having drawn out so much of the infection, burned a deep blue. Sati looked up at Kali, took a deep breath, and asked what had been troubling her since they had met. Why? Kali frowned. You are good people. I've seen the way you treat Ganesh and your men. You're tough but fair. Then why did you do all those terrible things? Kali held her breath. She looked up at the sky and shook her head. Think again, Didi. We have not done anything wrong. Kali, you and Ganesh may not personally have done anything wrong. But your people committed grave crimes. They killed innocents. My people work according to my orders, Didi. If you want to blame them, then you cannot absolve me. Think once again. No innocent people were killed in our attacks. I'm sorry, Kali, but that is not true. You attacked non-combatants. I've been thinking for some time. I agree that the Nagas are treated unfairly. The way Maluha treats Naga babies is unjust. But that doesn't mean every Maluhan, even if he personally hasn't done anything to hurt you, is your enemy. Didi, you think we would attack people just because they were part of a system which humiliated and wounded us? That is wrong. We never attacked anyone who hasn't directly harmed us. You did. Your people attacked temples. They attacked innocents. They killed vulnerable Brahmins. No. In every attack, we would let all the people except the temple Brahmins leave. Everyone. No innocent people were killed. Ever. But you did kill temple Brahmins. They are not warriors. They are innocent. I disagree. Why? Because they directly hurt our people. What? How? What wrong did the temple Brahmins do to you? I'll tell you. Shiva's caravan of ships was anchored at Vaishali, a pretty city on the Ganga River and an immediate neighbor of Branga. It had been three weeks since Shiva had allied with Parshuram. Vaishali had a massive Vishnu temple dedicated to the legendary fish god, Lord Matsya. Shiva was deeply disturbed by what Parshuram had said about the Nagas. He wanted to speak with the Vasudev one who was other than the ostracized Vasudev Brahman Kshatriya on board. Time and space had dimmed his anger towards the tribe. The temple was very close to the city's harbor. A massive crowd, including the king, had been waiting to receive him. But Shiva had requested that he be allowed to meet them later. He headed straight for the Matsya temple. It was a little taller than seventy meters comfortably above the minimum height needed for the Vasudevs to transmit radio waves. The temple was on the banks of the Ganga. Usually, temples would have had most of the space outside dedicated to landscaped gardens or grand enclosures. This temple was different. The land outside was dominated by intricate water bodies. Water from the Ganga had been routed into a system of elaborate canals around the main temple. And these canals made some of the most ethereal designs that Shiva had ever seen. It formed a map of ancient India at a time when sea levels were a lot lower. It told the story of Lord Manu and how he had led his band of followers out of his devastated homeland, the Sangam Tamil. Despite his urgency to meet the Vasudevs, Shiva held back, enthralled by the breathtaking designs. At long last, he tore his eyes away and walked up the steps to the main temple. Crowds hung outside, waiting quietly in accordance with their Nilkant's request. Shiva looked at the Sanctum Sanctorum at the far corner of the temple. It was far bigger than any other temple he had seen so far probably to accommodate the enormous statue of its reigning god. 
on a raised platform lay Lord Matsya, a giant fish who had helped bring Manu and his band of refugees from Sangam Tamil to safety. Manu, the founder of the Vedic civilization, had made it clear in his guidelines to his descendants that Lord Matsya must always be respected and worshipped as the first Lord Vishnu. If any of them were alive, it was due to the benefaction of the great Lord Matsya. Lord Matsya looks so much like the dolphins I've seen in the rivers here. Only he's much larger. Shiva bowed down and paid his respects to the Lord. He said a quick prayer and then sat down against one of the pillars. And then he thought out loud. Vasudevs, are you here? Nobody responded. No one from the temple came to see him. Is there no Vasudev here? Absolute silence. Is this not a Vasudev temple? Have I come to the wrong place? Shiva heard nothing except the gentle tinkle of the fountains in the temple compound. Damn! Shiva realized that maybe he had made a mistake. This temple probably wasn't a Vasudev outpost. His thoughts went back to the advice Sati had given to him. Maybe what Sati said is right. Maybe the Vasudevs were trying to help me. They did help. I would have been devastated if anything had happened to Karthik. A calm, clear voice rang out loud in his head. Your life is wise, great Mahadev. It is rare to find such beauty and wisdom in one person. Shiva looked up and around quickly. There was nobody. The voice was from one of the other Vasudev temples. He recognized it. It was the one that had commanded the Kashi Vasudev to give him the Naga medicine. Are you the leader, Panditji? No, my friend. You are. I am but your follower, and I bring the Vasudevs with me. Where are you? Ujjain? There was silence. What is your name, Panditji? I am Gopal. I am the chief guide of the Vasudevs. I bear the key task that Lord Ram had set us, assisting you in your karma. I need your advice, Panditji. As you wish, great Nilkant. What do you want to talk about? Sati, Kali, Ganesh and the Branga Kashi soldiers were marching towards Kashi. Loud conversation amongst them disturbed the silence of the forest. Vishwadyumna turned to Ganesh. My lord, don't you find the forest oddly silent? Ganesh raised his eyebrows, for the soldiers were creating quite a racket. You think our men should be talking even louder? No, my lord. We are loud enough. It is the rest of the forest that I am talking about. It's too quiet. Ganesh tilted his head. Vishwadimna was right. Not a single animal or bird sound. He looked around. His instincts told him that something was wrong. He stared hard into the woods. Then, shaking his head, he looked ahead and goaded his horse into moving faster. A short distance away, an injured animal, massive in his proportions, with his wounds partially healed, crept slowly forward. The shaft of a broken arrow, buried deep in his shoulder, caused the liger to limp a little. Two lionesses followed him silently. Chapter 18 The Function of Evil This country is very confusing. Gopal thought softly. Why would you say that, my friend? The Nagas are obviously the people who are evil, right? Almost everyone seems to agree. And yet, the Nagas helped a man in need, in the interests of justice. That's not how evil is supposed to be. A good point, great Nilkant. Considering the mistake I've already made, I am not about to attack anyone till I am sure. A wise decision. So, do you also think the Nagas may not be evil? How can I answer that, my friend? I do not have the wisdom to find that answer. I am not the Nilkant. Shiva smiled. But you do have an opinion, don't you? 
Shiva waited for Gopal to speak. When the Vasudev Pandit didn't, Shiva smiled even more broadly, giving up this discussion. Suddenly, a disturbing thought struck him. Please don't tell me, the Nagas also believe in the legend of the Nilkant? Gopal remained silent for a moment. Shiva repeated, frowning. Panditji, please answer me. Do the Nagas also believe in the Nilkant legend? As far as I know, great Mahadev, most of them do not believe in the Nilkant. But do you think that would make them evil? Shiva shook his head. No, of course not. Silence for some time. Shiva breathed deeply. <sighs> so what is the blessed answer? I have travelled through all of India, met practically all the tribes except the Nagas, and if none are evil, maybe evil hasn't arisen. Maybe I am not required. Are you sure it is only people who can be evil, my friend? There may be attachment to evil within some. There may be a small part of evil within them. But could the great evil, the one that awaits the Nilkant, exist beyond mere humans? Shiva frowned. I don't understand. Can evil be too big to be concentrated within just a few men? Shiva remained silent. Lord Manu had said, it's not people who are evil. True evil exists beyond them. It attracts people. It causes confusion amongst its enemies. But evil in itself is too big to be confined to just a few. Shiva frowned. You make it sound like evil is a power as strong as good. That it doesn't work by itself, but uses people as its medium. These people, maybe even good people, find purpose in serving evil. How can it be destroyed if it serves a purpose? That is an interesting thought, O'Neill Kant, that evil serves a purpose. What purpose? The purpose of destruction? Why would the universe plan that? Let's look at it another way. Do you believe there is nothing random in the universe? That everything exists for a reason? That everything serves a purpose? Yes. If anything appears random, it only means that we haven't discovered its purpose just as yet. So why does evil exist? Why can't it be destroyed once and for all? Even when it is apparently destroyed, it rises once again. Maybe after much time has elapsed, perhaps in another form, but evil does rise and will keep rising again and again. Why? Shiva narrowed his eyes. Absorbing Gopal's words. Because even evil serves a purpose. That is what Lord Manu believed. And the institution of the Mahadev acts as the balance, the control for that purpose. To take evil out of the equation at the correct time. Take it out of the equation? Asked a surprised Shiva. Yes, that is what Lord Manu said. It was just a line in his commandments. He said that the destroyers of evil would understand what he means. My understanding of it is that evil cannot and should not be destroyed completely, that it needs to be taken out of the equation at the right time, the time when it rises to cause total annihilation. Do you think he said that because the same evil may serve the purpose of good in another time? I came here for answers, my friend. You are only throwing more questions at me. Gopal laughed softly. I am sorry, my friend. Our job is to give you the clues that we know. We are not supposed to interfere in your judgment, for that could lead to the triumph of evil. I have heard that Lord Manu said good and evil are two sides of the same coin. Yes, he did say so. There are two sides of the same coin. He didn't explain any further. Strange. That doesn't make sense. Gopal smiled. It does sound strange. But I know you will make sense of it when the time is right. Shiva was silent for some time. He looked out across the temple pillars. 
In the distance, he could see the people of Vaishali outside the gates, waiting patiently for their Nilkant. Shiva stared hard, then turned back towards the idol of Lord Matsya. Gopal, my friend, what is the evil that Lord Rudra took out of the equation? I know the Asuras were not evil, so what evil did he destroy? You know the answer. No, I don't. Yes, you do. Think about it, Lord Nilkant. What is the enduring legacy of Lord Rudra? Shiva smiled. The answer was obvious. Thank you, Panditji. I think we've spoken enough for today. May I offer my opinion on your first question? Shiva was surprised. About the Nagas? Yes. Of course, please. It is obvious that you feel drawn to the Nagas. That you feel that your path to evil lies through them. Yes. That can be due to two reasons. Either evil exists at the end of that path. Or? Or evil has caused its greatest destruction on that path. Shiva took a deep breath. You mean the Nagas may be the ones who suffered the most at the hands of evil? Maybe. Shiva leaned back against the pillar. He closed his eyes. Maybe the Nagas deserve a hearing. Maybe everyone else has been unfair to them. Maybe they deserve the benefit of the doubt. But one of them has to answer to me. One of them awaits justice for Brihaspati's assassination. Gopal knew who Shiva was thinking about. He kept quiet. Sati stood in front of Atithigra in his private chambers. Standing next to her were Kali and Ganesh. The stunned king of Kashi did not know how to react. Sati had returned from Ichavar that morning with twenty-seven lion skins, proof of the destruction of the man-eating pride. Special prayers had been intoned at the Vishwanath temple for the brave Kashi soldiers who had died there. Garvas had been promoted to the rank of major. The courage of the Branga platoon had also been acknowledged. The Brangas of Kashi would be exempt from taxes for the next three months. But this specific problem was particularly naughty for Atithigva. He did not know how to react to the presence of the two Nagas beside Sati. He dare not expel the relatives of the wife of the Nilkant from his city. At the same time, he couldn't allow them to live openly in Kashi. His people would consider it a crime against the laws of karma. Superstitions about the Nagas ran deep. My lady, said Atithigva carefully, how can we allow this? Kali was staring at Atithigva, livid at the humiliation being meted out to her, a queen in her own right. She touched Sati's arm. Didi. Forget this. Sati just shook her head. Lord Atitigva, Kashi is a shining light of tolerance within India. It accepts all Indians no matter what their faith or way of life. Isn't rejecting some noble and valiant people just because they are Nagas going against the very reasons that make your city a beacon for the downtrodden and marginalized? Atitigva looked down. But, my lady, my people... Your Highness, should you give in to your people's biases? Or instead, lead them on to a better path? The Kashi king remained silent, wavering. Please do not forget, Your Highness, that if the Kashi platoon has returned and the villagers of Ichavar are alive today, it's due to the bravery of Kali, Ganesh and their men. We would all have been killed by the lions. They have saved us. Do they not deserve our honor in return? Atitigva nodded hesitantly. He looked out of the window of his private chambers. The Ganga flowed languidly, cradling the reflection of the eastern palace on the far bank, where his beloved sisters, Maya, led a miserable life, practically imprisoned. He would have loved to challenge the fear of the Nagas in his people, but had always lacked the courage. The fact that the Nilkant's wife stood by her family gave him hope. For who would dare to challenge the Nilkant? Everyone knew how Shiva had abolished one set of unjust laws, 
so why not the same for the Nagas too? The king turned back towards Sati. Your family can stay, my lady. I am sure they will be comfortable in the wing of the Kashi palace allocated to the Lord Nilkant. I am sure they will, replied a smiling Sati. Thank you so much, your highness. Shiva was standing at the head of the ship, Parvateshwar next to him. I have doubled the speed of the lead ship, my lord, said Parvateshwar. Shiva had asked Parvateshwar to ensure a quick arrival of their fleet to Kashi. He had been away from his family for more than two years. It was too long a time and he missed them dearly. Thank you, General, smiled Shiva. Parvateshwar bowed and turned to look at the Ganga again. Shiva spoke with a hint of a smile on his face. So, how is married life, General? Parvateshwar looked at Shiva with a broad smile. Heaven, my lord. Absolute heaven. A very intense heaven, though. Shiva smiled. Normal rules don't seem to apply, do they? Parvateshwar laughed out loud. <laughs> well, Anandmai continues to update the rules as each day comes along, and I just follow them. Shiva laughed loudly as well and patted his friend. <laughs> follow those rules, my friend. Follow those rules. She loves you. You will be happy with her. Parvateshwar nodded heartily. Anandmai told me that she has sent a cutter to Ayodhya to inform Emperor Dilipa of your nuptials, said Shiva. Yes, she has, said Parvateshwar. His Highness will be coming to Kashi to receive us. He has promised to hold another completely extravagant celebration for us in Kashi within ten days of our arrival. That should be fun. Yes, my lord? asked Nandi. Nandi and Bhagirath were with Shiva in his cabin. When we reach Kashi, stay close to Prince Bhagirath. Why, my lord? asked Bhagirath. Shiva raised his hand. Just trust me. Bhagirath narrowed his eyes. My father is coming to Kashi. Shiva nodded. I will be the prince's shadow, my lord, said Nandi. Nothing will happen to him as long as I am alive. Shiva looked up. I don't want anything happening to you either, Nandi. Both of you keep your eyes open and remain careful. My son! cried Sati as Karthik ran into her arms. Karthik was only three. But due to the somras, he looked like a six-year-old. He screamed, Ma! Sati twirled her son around happily. I've missed you so much. I missed you too, said Karthik softly, still unhappy about his mother leaving him behind. I'm sorry I had to go away, my child. But I had very important work to do. Next time, take me with you. I will try. Karthik smiled. Seemingly mollified, he then pulled his wooden sword out of the scabbard. Look at this, Ma. Sati frowned. What's this? I started learning how to fight the day you left. If I was a good soldier, you would have taken me with you, no? Sati smiled broadly and plonked Karthik on her lap. You are a born soldier, my son. Karthik smiled and hugged his mother. You know how you always asked me for a brother, Karthik? Karthik nodded vigorously. Yes, yes. Well, I have found a wonderful brother for you. An elder brother who will always take care of you. Karthik frowned and looked towards the door. He saw a giant of a man enter the chambers. He was wearing a simple white dhoti and anangvastram was draped loosely across his right shoulder. His immense stomach jiggling with every breath. But it was the face that startled Karthik. The head of an elephant on top of a human body? Ganesh smiled broadly, his heart beating uncertainly, anxious for Karthik's acceptance. How are you, Karthik? The normally fearless Karthik hid behind his mother. Karthik? Smiled Sati, pointing at his elder brother, Ganesh. Why don't you say hello to your dada? The boy continued to stare at Ganesh. Are you human? Yes, I'm your brother, smiled Ganesh. Karthik didn't say anything, 
but Sati had taught Ganesh well. The Naga held out his hand, displaying a succulent mango, Karthik's favorite fruit. The boy was at once delighted and surprised at seeing a mango so late in the year. He inched forward. Do you want this, Karthik? asked Ganesh. Karthik frowned, drawing out his wooden sword. You're not going to make me fight for it, are you? Ganesh laughed. <laughs> no, I'm not. But I will charge a hug from you. Karthik hesitated and looked at Sati. Sati nodded and smiled. You can trust him. Karthik moved slowly and grabbed the mango. Ganesh embraced his little brother, who immediately got busy biting strongly into his favorite fruit. He looked up at Ganesh and smiled, whispering between loud slurps. Wow! Thank you, Dada! Ganesh smiled again and patted Karthik lightly on his head. The lead ship docked lightly into the Dasashwamedh cart. As the gangway was being drawn, Shiva's eyes desperately sought Sati. He could see Emperor Dilipa and King Atitigva standing at the royal platform with their families. There was a multitude of Kashi citizens thronging the carts, but where is she? I'll find her, my lord, said Bhagirath as he disembarked, closely followed by Nandi. And Bhagirath? Yes, my lord, said Bhagirath, stopping. After all this is over, please take Purvaka to the king's palace. Ensure that he is comfortable in my family's area. Yes, my lord, said Bhagirath, as he darted away, ignoring Dilipa, his father and the emperor of Swadweep. But Nandi was surprised at the changes visible in the emperor. Dilipa looked at least ten years younger, his face glowing with good health. Nandi frowned before turning to catch up with Bhagirath. Shiva stepped off the gangway. Dilipa directed one long, hard stare at the retreating form of his son and shook his head, before turning towards the Nilkant. He bowed low before Shiva, touching his feet. May your dynasty continue to spread prosperity, your highness, said Shiva, himself bowing his head with a namaste to Dilipa. Virbhadra, meanwhile, had found Kritika and spun her in his arms. An ecstatic yet embarrassed Kritika tried to free herself, blushing as she asked her husband to restrain his public display of affection. Atithigva also stepped forward and sought Shiva's blessings. Having completed the formalities, the Nilkant turned, searching for his family. Where is my family, your highness? Baba! Shiva turned with a broad smile. Karthik was running towards him. As he lifted his son into his arms, Shiva said, By the holy lake, you have grown really fast, Karthik. I missed you, whispered Karthik, holding his father tight. I missed you too, said Shiva. His pleasure at seeing his son turned into surprise as he recognized the mouth-watering smell of ripened mangoes. Who has been giving you mangoes so late in the season? Just then Sati appeared in front of Shiva. A smiling Shiva held Karthik to his right and wrapped his left arm around Sati, holding his world close to him, oblivious to the thousands staring at them. I've missed you both so much. And we missed you, smiled Sati, pulling her head back to glance at her husband. Shiva pulled her close again. Eyes closed, taking pleasure in his family's loving touch, his wife and son resting their heads on his shoulders. Let's go home. The carriage was moving slowly down Kashi's sacred avenue. The emperor of Ayodhya and the king of Kashi followed in their carriages while the brigade that had travelled with Shiva marched behind. Citizens had lined the streets to catch their first glimpse of their lord after more than two and a half years. Shiva sat comfortably, Sati next to him and Karthik on his lap, waving to the crowds. Both Shiva and Sati spoke simultaneously. I, I have, have something to tell. tell. Shiva started laughing. <laughs> you first. No, no, you first, said Sati. I insist. 
you first. Sati swallowed. What have you found out about the Nagas, Shiva? Surprising things, actually. Maybe I have misjudged them. We need to find out more about them. Maybe they're not all bad. Maybe they just have a few bad apples amongst them, like in all communities. Sati sighed deeply, finding some release for the tension coiled inside her like a snake. What happened? asked Shiva, staring hard at his wife. Um, there's something that I have also discovered recently. Something very surprising. Something that was kept hidden from me until now. It's about the Nagas. What? I found that... Uh, Shiva was surprised to see Sati so nervous. What's the matter, darling? I found out that I'm related to them. What? Yes. How can that be? Your father hates the Nagas. It could be guilt more than hatred. Guilt? I was not born alone. Shiva frowned. A twin was born along with me. I have a sister. Shiva was shocked. Where is she? Who kidnapped her? How did this happen in Meluha? She was not kidnapped, whispered Sati. She was abandoned. Abandoned? Shiva stared at his wife, at a loss for words. Yes, she was born a Naga. Shiva held Sati's hand. Where did you find her? Is she all right? Sati looked up at Shiva, her eyes moist. I didn't find her. She found me. She saved my life. Shiva smiled, not at all surprised to hear yet another tale of Naga heroism and generosity. What's her name? Kali. Queen Kali. Queen? Yes, the queen of the Nagas. Shiva's eyes widened in surprise. Kali may be the one who would help him find Brihaspati's killer. Maybe that's why fate had conspired to bring them together. Where is she? Here in Kashi, outside our palace, waiting to meet you, waiting for you to accept her. Shiva smiled, shaking his head and pulling Sati close to him. She's your family. That makes her my family. Where's the question of my not accepting her? Sati smiled slightly, resting her head on Shiva's shoulders. But she is not the only Naga waiting for your acceptance. Shiva frowned. Another... Even more tragic secret was kept from me, said Sati. What? I was told ninety years back that my first child was still born, as still as a statue. Shiva nodded, as though sensing where this conversation was headed, holding his wife's hand tighter. That, that was a lie, sobbed Sati. He, he was alive? He is still alive. Shiva's jaw dropped in shock. You mean, I have another son? Sati stared up at Shiva, smiling through her tears. By the holy lake, I have another son! Sati nodded, happy at Shiva's joy. Madra, drive quickly. My son waits for me. Chapter 19 The Rage of the Blue Lord Shiva's carriage quickly turned into the gates of Atitigwa's palace. As it sped along the road around the central garden, an excited Shiva lifted Karthik into his arms and reached for the door. He was off as soon as the vehicle stopped, setting Karthik on the ground, holding his hand and walking quickly ahead. Sati followed. Shiva stopped in his tracks as he saw Kali, holding a puja thali, a prayer tray, with a ceremonial lamp and flowers. What the... Standing in front of Shiva was a splitting image of Sati. Her eyes, face, build, everything. Except that her skin was a jet black to Sati's bronze. Her hair open, unlike Sati, who usually restrained her flowing tresses. The woman was wearing royal clothing and ornaments. A cream and red-colored Angavastram covered her entire torso. Then he noticed the two extra hands on her shoulders. A nervous Kali continued to stare at Shiva, unsure. Much to her surprise, Shiva stepped forward and embraced her gently, careful not to disturb the puja thali. What a pleasure it is to meet you, said Shiva, smiling broadly. Kali smiled tentatively, 
shocked by Shiva's warm gesture, clearly at a loss for words. Shiva tapped the puja thali. I think you are supposed to move this around my face six or seven times in order to welcome me home. Kali laughed. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just that I have been very nervous. Nothing to be nervous about. Grinned Shiva. Just circle the thali around, shower flowers on me, and be sure not to drop the lamp. Burns are damn painful. Kali laughed and completed the ceremony, applying a red tilak on Shiva's forehead. And now. Said Shiva, "Where's my other son?" Kali stepped aside. Shiva saw Ganesh in the distance, atop the stairs leading to Atithi Gwa's main palace. "That's my dada," beamed Kartik at his father. Shiva smiled at Kartik. "Let's go meet him." Holding Kartik's hand, Shiva walked up the flight of stairs with Sati and Kali in tow. Everyone else waited quietly at the bottom, giving the family its own private moment. Ganesh, in a red dhoti and white angavastram, was standing at the entryway of his mother's wing of the palace, almost like a guard. As Shiva reached him, Ganesh bent to touch his father's feet. Shiva touched Ganesh's head gently, held his shoulders, and pulled the naga up to embrace him, blessing him with a long life. Ayushman Bhava, my son. Shiva suddenly stopped as he stared hard at Ganesh's calm, almond-shaped eyes. His hands were rigid on Ganesh's shoulders, eyes narrowed hard. Ganesh shut his eyes and cursed his fate silently. He knew he had been recognized. Shiva's eyes continued to bore into Ganesh. Sati, looking surprised, whispered, "What's the matter, Shiva?" Shiva ignored her. He continued to stare at Ganesh with repressed rage. He reached for his pouch. I have something that belongs to you. Ganesh kept quiet, continuing to stare at Shiva, his eyes melancholic. He didn't need to look in order to know what Shiva was bringing out of his pouch. The bracelet, whose clasp had been destroyed, belonged to him. He had lost it at Mount Mandar. It was frayed at the edges by flames that had tried to consume it. The embroidered symbol of Om in the center was unblemished, but it wasn't a normal Om symbol. The representation of the ancient holy word had been constructed from snakes, the serpent Om. Ganesh quietly took his bracelet from Shiva's hand. Sati looked on with disbelieving eyes. Shiva, what is going on? Furious rage was pouring out of Shiva's eyes. Shiva repeated Sati as she touched her husband's shoulder anxiously. Shiva flinched at Sati's touch. Your son killed my brother. He growled. Sati was shocked, disbelieving. Shiva spoke again. This time his voice was hard, furious. Your son killed Brihaspati. Kali sprang forward, but it was an. The queen of the Nagas fell silent at a gesture from Ganesh. The Naga continued to look straight at Shiva, offering no explanations, waiting for the Nilkant's verdict, his punishment. Shiva stepped close to Ganesh, uncomfortably close, till his fuming breath blew hard on Ganesh. You are my wife's son. It's the only reason why I'm not going to kill you. Ganesh lowered his eyes, hands held in supplication, refusing to say anything. Get out of my house! Roared Shiva. Get out of this land! Never show your face here again. The next time, I may not be so forgiving. But, but, but Shiva. He is my son," begged Sati. "He killed Brihaspati." Shiva. He killed Brihaspati. Sati stared blankly, tears flowing down her cheeks. Shiva, he he is my son. I cannot live without him. Then live without me. Sati was stunned. Shiva, please, don't do this. How can you ask me to make this choice? 
Ganesh finally spoke. Father, I... Shiva interrupted Ganesh angrily. I am not your father. Ganesh bowed his head, took a deep breath and spoke up once again. Oh, great Mahadev, you are known for your fairness, your sense of justice. The crime is mine. Don't punish my mother for my sins. Ganesh pulled his knife out, the same knife that Sati had flung at him in Ayodhya. Take my life, but don't curse my mother with a fate worse than death. She cannot live without you. No! Screamed Sati as she darted in front of Ganesh. Please, Shiva, he is my son. He is my son. Shiva's anger turned ice cold. Looks like you've made your choice. He picked up Karthik. Shiva. Pleaded Sati. Please, don't go. Please. Shiva looked at Sati. His eyes moist, but voice ice cold. This is something I cannot accept, Sati. Brihaspati was like my brother. Shiva walked down the steps, carrying Karthik with him, as a shock Kashi citizenry kept deathly silent. Shiva doesn't know the entire picture. Why didn't you tell him? Asked an agitated Kali. Kali and Ganesh were sitting in Sati's chambers in Atitigva's palace. Sati, torn between her love for her long-lost son and her devotion to her husband, had gone to the Branga building, where Shiva had set up temporary quarters. She was trying to reason with him. I can't. I have given my word, Mossy. Answered Ganesh, his calm voice hiding the deep sadness within. But... No, Mossy. This remains between you and me. There is only one condition under which the secret behind the attack on Mount Mandar can be revealed. I don't see that happening too soon. But tell your mother at least. A word of honor does not stop at a mother's door. Didi is suffering. I thought you would do anything for her. I will. She can live without me but not without the Mahadev. She's not letting me leave because of her guilt at not being there for me earlier. What are you saying? You will leave? Yes, in another ten days. Once the Meluhan general and the Chandravanshi princess's wedding celebrations are done, then father can return home. Your mother will not allow this. It doesn't matter. I will leave. I will not be the reason for my parents' separation. Your Highness, said Kanakala, the Meluhan prime minister, it is not advisable for you to leave for Swadweep without a formal invitation. It is against protocol. What nonsense, said Daksha. I am the emperor of India. I can go wherever I please. Kanakala was a loyal prime minister, but she did not want her emperor to commit any act which would embarrass the empire. But the terms of the Ayodhya Treaty are that Swadweep is only our vassal and has direct control over its own territory. Protocol dictates that we seek their permission. They cannot deny permission. You are their lord. But it's a formality that must be completed. No formalities needed. I'm just a father going to meet his favorite daughter. Kanakala frowned. Your Highness, you have only one daughter. Yes, yes, I know, said Daksha waving his hand dismissively. Look, I am leaving in three weeks. You can send a messenger to Swadweep asking for permission, all right? Your Highness, bird couriers are still not set up in Ayodhya. You know how inefficient those people are. And Ayodhya is further than Kashi. So even if the messenger leaves today, he will reach Ayodhya in little over three months. You will reach Kashi at the same time. Daksha smiled. Yes, I will. Go and make the arrangements for my departure. Kanakala sighed, bowed and left the chambers. The Emperor of Swadweep, Dilipa, had planned grand festivities to celebrate the wedding of his daughter Anandmai with Parvateshwar. 
but the unexpected bitterness between the Mahadev and his wife had soured the mood. However, the pujas could not be cancelled. It would be an insult to the gods. While all the parties had been put on hold, the pujas to the elemental gods Agni, Vayu, Prithvi, Varun, Surya and Som were to proceed as planned. The puja for the sun god was being conducted at the Surya temple on the sacred avenue, just a little south of Assi Ghat. A grand platform had been erected on the road, directly overlooking the temple. Shiva and Sati were seated next to each other on specific thrones designed for them. Unlike their earlier public appearances, they were sitting stiff and apart. Shiva was not even looking at Sati, righteous anger still radiating from every pore in his body. He had only come for the puja and would return to the Branga residence as soon as it was over. Every citizen of Kashi who had never seen Shiva's temper was deeply troubled, but none more than Karthik. He had been pestering both his parents to get back together. Knowing Karthik would get even more insistent if he saw the both of them together, Shiva had told Kritika to take Karthik to the park adjoining the nearby Sankat Mochan temple. Next to Shiva, on the platform built for the thrones, were Kali, Bhagirath, Tilipa, Atithigva and Ayurvati. Parvateshwar and Anand Mai were at the temple platform, where the Surya Pandit helped them consecrate their love with the purifying blessings of the sun god. To avoid an embarrassing situation, Ganesh had wisely declined his invitation to the puja. While all of Kashi was at the puja, Ganesh sat by himself at the Sankat Mochan temple. He had first gone to the adjoining park to meet his little brother for the first time in ten days, carrying a sack full of mangoes. After a lively thirty minutes, Ganesh had retired to the temple, leaving Karthik to play with Kritika and his five bodyguards. He sat there quietly, gazing at Lord Hanuman, the most ardent devotee of Lord Ram. Lord Hanuman was called Sankat Mochan for a reason. People believed he always helped his devotees in a crisis. Ganesh thought that even Lord Hanuman would find it impossible to help him get out of this mess. Neither could he imagine a life without his mother, nor could he bear it if he became the reason for his parents living separately. He had decided to leave Kashi the next day. But he knew that he would spend the rest of his life pining for his mother, now that he had experienced her love. He smiled as he heard the loud cacophony of Karthik's boisterous antics in the park. Carefree laughter of a soul strongly nourished by his mother's love. Ganesh sighed, knowing such carefree laughter would never be a part of his destiny. He drew out his sword, pulled a smooth stone and started doing what Kshatriyas usually do when they have nothing else to do, sharpen their blades. So lost was Ganesh in his thoughts that he paid heed to his gut instinct quite late. Something strange was happening in the park. He held his breath and listened. And then it hit him. The park had gone absolutely quiet. What had happened to the loud laughter of Karthik, Kritika and his companions? Ganesh got up quickly, put his sword into his scabbard and started walking towards the park. And then he heard it. A low growl, followed by a deafening roar. The kill was nigh. Lions! Ganesh drew his sword and started sprinting. A man was stumbling towards him. One of the Kashi soldiers who was slashed across his arm. The clear markings of sharp claws. How many? Ganesh was loud enough for the soldier to hear even at a distance. The Kashi soldier did not respond. He just stumbled forward, shell-shocked. Ganesh reached him in no time, jolted him hard and repeated again. How many? Three, said the soldier. Get the Mahadev. The soldier still looked shocked. Ganesh shook him again. Get the Mahadev now! The soldier started running towards the sun temple as Ganesh turned towards the park. 
the Kashi soldier knew what he was running away from, and yet his feet were unsteady. Ganesh knew what he was running towards, but his pace was sure and strong. He used a side stone as leverage to leap over the park fence without a sound. He landed on the other side, close to a lioness busy crushing the broken neck of a soldier between her jaws, asphyxiating an already dead man. Ganesh slashed at her as he ran by, cutting through a major vein on her shoulder. Blood poured out of the lioness's wound as Ganesh raced towards Kritika, another Kashi soldier, and Karthik, who were at the center of the garden. Two other soldiers were lying dead in a far corner. Judging from their positions, they were probably the first to be killed. Ganesh dashed to Kritika's side. They were hemmed in from one side by a lioness and a massive liger. Bhumi Devi, be merciful. They have followed us from a chawar. The other side was blocked off by the lioness, whose shoulder was bleeding profusely after Ganesh's blow. Karthik, his wooden sword drawn, was ready for battle. Ganesh knew Karthik was childishly brave enough to charge at the liger with just his wooden sword. He stood in front of his brother, with Kritika on one side and the soldier on the other. No way out, whispered Kritika, sword drawn. Ganesh knew Kritika was not a trained warrior. Her maternal instincts would drive her to protect Karthik, but she probably wouldn't be able to kill any of the cats. The soldier on the other side was shivering. He was unlikely to be much help. Ganesh nodded towards the bleeding lioness limping towards them. She'll not last too long. I've cut a major vein. The liger was circling them while moving towards the front as the lionesses flanked the humans. Ganesh knew it was only a matter of time. They were preparing for the charge. Pull back, whispered Ganesh. Slowly. There was a hollow in the main trunk of a banyan tree behind them. Ganesh intended to push Karthik in there and defend it from the lionesses. We can't last long, said Kritika. I'll try to distract them. You run with Karthik. Ganesh didn't turn towards Kritika, staring hard at the liger. But his admiration for Veerbhadra's wife shot up. She was willing to die for his brother. That won't work. Said Ganesh, "I can't move fast enough with Karthik. The walls are high. Help is on its way. The Mahadev is coming. We just have to hold the lines off for some time." Kritika and the soldier followed Ganesh's lead as they edged slowly to the rear, pushing Karthik back. The liger and lionesses crept forward. Their blind aggression from just a few moments earlier dissipating at the sight of the giant man holding a blood-stained sword. A little while later, Karthik had been pushed into the banyan hollow, with the tree's hanging roots tied around it to prevent him from charging out. He was safe, at least for as long as Ganesh stood. The cats charged. Ganesh was surprised to see the limping lioness bounding forward. Kritika was covering that area. Stay low! Shouted Ganesh. He couldn't move to support Kritika, since the liger could charge through the opening to attack Karthik. Stay low, Kritika. She's injured. She can't leap high. Kritika had held her sword low, waiting for the wounded lioness to reach her. But to her surprise, the big cat suddenly veered left. As Kritika was about to charge after her, she heard a blood-curdling scream. The lioness from the other side had used the distraction and crept up to the Kashi soldier. He was screaming in agony as the lioness dragged his body back, slashing at him with her claws. The soldier kept screeching, trying to push the lioness back, hitting her with weak blows from his sword. She kept biting into him, finally getting a chokehold on the convulsing soldier's neck. Moments later, he was dead. The liger remained stationary in front of Ganesh, blocking any escape. The other lioness left the dead Kashi soldier and returned to position. Ganesh breathed slowly. He marveled at the intelligent pack hunting behavior these animals were displaying. Stay low," said Ganesh to Kritika. "I will cover the liger and this lioness. You have to focus on the injured one. I cannot see to all three. 
These animals hunt in packs. Whoever's distracted is dead. Kritika nodded as the injured lioness started ambling towards her. The animal was losing too much blood from her shoulder injury. She was slow in her movements. Suddenly she charged at Kritika. As the lioness came close, she leapt high, as high as her injured shoulder allowed. It was a weak jump. Kritika bent low, holding her sword up high, brutally stabbing it into the lioness's heart. The beast fell on Kritika and was soon dead. Ganesh glanced at Kritika out of the corner of his eye. Before being felled, the lioness had managed to dig her claws into Kritika and rip away a part of her shoulder. Kritika was bleeding profusely, practically immobile under the lioness's corpse, which was pinning her down. But she was alive. She had Ganesh in her line of sight. Ganesh flipped his shield onto his back, pulled out his second shorter sword, and stood close to the banyan tree. The short sword had a twin blade, which clipped together as the victim's body moved. It was a fearsome weapon, if it was stabbed deep into a body, as it would cut again and again. Ganesh waited, biding time, hoping the Mahadev would arrive before it was too late. The liger moved to Ganesh's right, the lioness to his left. There was enough distance between the beasts to make it difficult for Ganesh to observe both of them at the same time. Having established a good offensive position, the animals moved forward, slowly, in sync. The lioness suddenly charged. Ganesh lashed out with his left hand, but the shorter sword did not have the reach. The movement forced him to look left. The liger, taking advantage, charged into Ganesh and bit hard into his right leg, at the same spot that Ganesh had been injured in, at Ichavar. Ganesh screamed in agony and swung hard with his right sword arm, slashing the liger across the face. The liger retreated, but not before he had bitten off a chunk of Ganesh's thigh. Ganesh was losing blood fast. He stepped back, leaning against the banyan tree. His kid brother was screaming behind him, shouting to be let out so that he could battle the lions too. Ganesh did not move, and the cats charged again. This time the liger came first. Seeing a pattern in their attack, Ganesh kept his eyes dead center, able to now see both the liger and lioness. He held his right sword out to stop the liger from coming in too close. The liger slowed down, and the lioness came in faster. Ganesh jabbed hard with the short sword, straight into the lioness's shoulder, but not before she had bitten into Ganesh's limb. The lioness retreated with Ganesh's short, twin-bladed sword buried in her shoulder, after having left another gaping injury in Ganesh's left arm. Ganesh knew that he couldn't stand on his feet much longer. He was losing too much blood. He did not want to fall sideways, because Karthik would then become vulnerable. He fell back and sat against the tree, covering the hollow with his body. The animals would have to go through him to get to his brother. Due to the severe loss of blood, Ganesh's vision was beginning to blur. But despite that, he could see that the wound on the lioness had been telling. She was still struggling at a distance from him, trying to lick her shoulder, unable to stand straight. As she moved, the twin blade cut further into her, hacking tissue away from bone. He saw the liger moving in from the right, edging closer. Once close enough, the liger bounded and lashed out with his paw, while Ganesh slashed with his sword at the same time. The liger's claws tore through Ganesh's face, causing a deep gash on his long nose. Simultaneously, Ganesh's blow gouged the liger's left eye. The animal retreated, howling in agony. But Karthik had seen what Ganesh hadn't. He was trying to reach out with his wooden sword, but he couldn't get far enough. Dada, look out! The lioness had used Ganesh's distraction to crawl closer. She lunged forward and bit into Ganesh's chest. Ganesh swung his blade, slashing her face. The lioness retreated, snarling in pain, but not before ripping out a large amount of flesh from Ganesh's torso. 
The Naga's heart, pumping blood and adrenaline through the body at a furious rate, was now working against him, as the numerous wounds leaked blood alarmingly. Ganesh knew his end was near. He wouldn't last much longer. And then he heard a loud war cry. Har Har Mahadev! A warm, comforting darkness was beckoning Ganesh. He struggled to stay awake. Nearly fifty furious Suryavanshi soldiers charged into the park. They fell upon the two big cats. The weakened animals did not stand a chance and were soon killed. Through his rapidly fading vision, Ganesh thought he saw a handsome figure rushing towards him, bloodied sword held to the side, his throat an iridescent blue. Behind the man, he could barely make out the blurred vision of a bronzed woman racing towards him, a warrior princess. The blood of the Liger splattered all over her. The Naga smiled, delighted to be the bearer of good news to two of the most important people in his world. Don't worry, Baba, whispered Ganesh to his father. Your son is safe. He's hidden behind me. Saying so, Ganesh collapsed, unconscious. Chapter 20 Never Alone, My Brother Ganesh thought he should feel pain, but there was nothing. He opened his eyes. He could barely distinguish the formidable Ayurvati next to his body. He shifted his eyes down towards his ravaged body. Skin torn asunder, flesh ripped apart, blood congealed all over, arm bones sticking out, a gaping hole in his chest, ribs cracked and visible. Bhumi Devi be merciful. I don't stand a chance. Ganesh returned to darkness. A sharp sting on his chest. His eyes opened slowly, barely. Through the slits, he could see Ayurvati changing his dressing. He could feel again. A good thing, right? He slipped into his dream world once again. A soft caress. Then the hand moved away. A sleeping Ganesh moved his head. He wanted the hand back. It returned to his face, stroking it gently. Ganesh opened his eyes slightly. Sati was sitting next to him. Leaning over, her eyes swollen, red. Ma? But Sati didn't respond. Maybe she hadn't heard him. Ganesh could see outside the window behind Sati. It was raining. The monsoons? How long have I been unconscious? Ganesh saw a man leaning next to the window, against the wall. A strong man, whose normally mischievous eyes were expressionless. A man with a blue throat. A man staring intensely at him, trying to figure him out. Sleep snatched Ganesh away yet again. A warm touch on his arm. Someone was gently applying the ointment on him. The Naga opened his eyes slowly and was surprised to see the hand applying the medicine so tenderly was not soft and feminine, but strong and masculine. He turned his eyes slowly to see the kindly doctor. The torso was powerful and muscled, but the neck, it was different. It radiated a divine blue light. Ganesh was stunned. A gasp escaped his mouth. The hand applying the medicine froze. Ganesh could feel a pair of eyes boring into him. And then the Nilkant rose and left the room. Ganesh shut his eyes again. Ganesh finally emerged from his sleepy cocoon after a long, long time without the immediate need to slip back into its safety. He could hear the soft pitter-patter of raindrops. He loved the monsoon. The heavenly whiff of a rejuvenated earth, the melody of falling rain. He turned his head slightly to his left. It was enough to wake Sati. 
She immediately rose from her bed at the far end of the room and walked up to Ganesh. She pulled a chair up close and rested her hand on her son's. How are you, my son? Ganesh smiled softly. He turned his head a little more. Sati smiled and ran her fingers across her son's face. She knew he liked that. Kritika? She's much better, said Sati. She wasn't as badly injured as you. In fact, she was out of the Ayuralai very quickly, just two weeks. How long? How long have you been here? Ganesh nodded in reply. Sixty days, in and out of consciousness. Rains. The monsoon is almost over. The moisture led to some complications, slowing down your healing process. Ganesh took a deep breath. He was tired. Go to sleep, said Sati. Ayurvati ji says you're well on your way to recovery. You will be out of here very soon. Ganesh smiled and went back to sleep. Ganesh was woken up abruptly by Ayurvati, who was staring at him pointedly. How long have I been sleeping? Since the last time you woke up, a few hours. I sent your mother home. She needs to rest. Ganesh nodded. Ayurvati picked up some paste she had needed. Open your mouth. Ganesh winced at the foul-smelling paste. <sighs> what is this, Ayurvati ji? It will make the pain go away. But I don't feel any pain. You will when I apply the ointment. So open your mouth and keep it under your tongue. Ayurvati waited for the medicine to take effect. Then she opened the dressing on Ganesh's chest. His wound had healed dramatically. Flesh had filled up and some scar tissue had formed. The skin will smoothen out, said an aloof Ayurvati. I'm a warrior, smiled Ganesh. Scars are more welcome than smooth skin. Ayurvati stared at Ganesh, impassive. Then she picked up a bowl. Ganesh held his breath as Ayurvati started applying the ointment. Despite the anesthetic, the ointment still stung. She finished applying the paste quickly and covered the wound again with a bandage of neem leaves. Ayurvati was quick, efficient, and sure. Qualities that Ganesh admired deeply. The Lord of the People took a deep breath, gathering some strength. Uh, I didn't think I would survive. Your reputation is truly deserved, Ayurvati ji. Ayurvati frowned. Where did you hear of me? I was injured in Ichhavar as well, and Ma told me that you could have healed me twice as fast. She said that you are the best doctor in the world. Ayurvati raised her eyebrows. You have a silver tongue, capable of making anyone smile. Just like the Lord Nilkant, it's sad you don't have his untainted heart. Ganesh kept quiet. I admired Brihaspati. He was not just a good man, but a fount of knowledge. The world suffered when he died before his time. Ganesh did not respond. His sad eyes looking deep into the doctor's eyes. Now, let me look at that arm," said Ayurvati. She yanked his bandage open. Hard enough to make it sting, but soft enough to not cause any serious damage. Ganesh didn't flinch. The next day, Ganesh woke up to find his mother and aunt in the room, whispering. "Ma, Mossy," whispered Ganesh. Both the sisters turned to him with a smile. "Do you want something to eat or drink?" asked Sati. <sighs> Yes, ma. But can I also go for a walk today? I have been sleeping for sixty days. This is terrible. Kali smiled. I will speak with Ayurvati. For now, stay put. As Kali left to find Ayurvati, Sati pulled her chair closer to Ganesh. I've got parathas for you, said Sati, opening a small ivory box that she was carrying. Ganesh beamed. He absolutely loved the stuffed flat breads his mother made. But his smile vanished just as quickly when he remembered that so did his stepfather Shiva. Sati rose to find the mouth rinse Ayurvati had prescribed for Ganesh before he could eat. Has father returned to your quarters, ma? Sati looked back from the medicine cabinet. Now you don't worry about these things. Has he started speaking to you at least? 
You needn't worry about this, said Sati as she walked back to Ganesh. The Naga was staring at the ceiling, guilt gnawing at his heart. He narrowed his eyes. Did he? Yes, he did, replied Sati. Shiva came to check on you every day, but I don't think he'll be coming from today. Ganesh smiled sadly and bit his lip. Sati patted him on the head. Everything will become all right when it is meant to become all right. I wish I could explain what happened at Mount Mandar. I wish I could explain why it happened. I don't know if he would forgive me, but at least he would understand. Kali has told me a little bit. I, I understand somewhat. But Brihaspati ji, he was a great man. The world lost something when he died. Even I cannot understand completely. And Shiva, Shiva loved him like a brother. How can we expect him to understand? Ganesh looked at Sati with sad eyes. But you saved Karthik's life, said Sati. You saved me. I know that's worth a lot to Shiva. Give him time. He will come around. Ganesh remained silent, clearly skeptical. The next day, with Ayurvati's permission, Ganesh left his Ayuralay room to take a short walk in the garden next door to Atithigwa's grand palace. Ganesh walked slowly, leaning on Kali's shoulder, with a walking stick taking the bulk of his weight. He had wanted to walk alone, but Kali would hear none of it. As they reached the garden, they heard the loud sounds of clashing steel. Ganesh narrowed his eyes. Someone's practicing, practicing hard. Kali smiled. She knew Ganesh liked nothing better than seeing warriors practice. Let's go. The Naga queen helped Ganesh to the central area of the garden. Ganesh was, meanwhile, commenting on the quality of the practice based on the sounds he heard. Quick moves! These are steel swords, not meant for practice. Accomplished warriors duel there. Kali simply helped Ganesh through the fence gate. As they entered, Ganesh recoiled. Kali strengthened her hold on him. Relax, he is not in danger. At a distance, Karthik was engaged in a furious duel with Parvateshwar. He was moving at a speed that shocked Ganesh. The three-year-old may have been the size of a seven-year-old, but he was still significantly smaller than the gargantuan Parvateshwar. The Meluhan general was swinging hard with his sword, but Karthik was using his size to devastating effect. He bent low, forcing Parvateshwar to sweep lower with his sword, an action that most skilled swordsmen were not good at. Nobody trained to battle midgets. Karthik also had the ability to jab and swing with shattering speed and accuracy. Swinging up at Parvateshwar at an angle that any grown man would have found impossible to defend. In just a few minutes, Karthik had already stopped short of three deadly blows at the Meluhan general, all in the lower torso area. Ganesh stood gaping. He has been practicing every day since you were injured, said Kali. Ganesh was even more amazed by something he had seen only a handful of warriors do. Karthik uses two swords simultaneously. Yes, smiled Kali. He doesn't use a shield. He strikes with his left hand also. The boy says that offense is better than defense. Ganesh heard Sati's voice speak out loudly. Stop! He turned to see his mother rise from a ledge at the corner. Sorry to disturb you, Pitratulya, said Sati to Parvateshwar. The man she respected like a father. But perhaps Karthik may want to meet his dada. Parvateshwar looked up at Ganesh. The Meluhan general did not acknowledge Sati's older son, not even a curt nod. He simply stepped back. Karthik smiled at seeing Ganesh ambling slowly towards him. Ganesh was shocked at the change in Karthik. His eyes didn't have the innocent look of a little boy any more. They had steel in them, pure, unadulterated steel. You fight very well, brother," said Ganesh. "I didn't know." Karthik hugged his brother, holding him tight.
The embrace hurt Ganesh's wounds, but he didn't flinch or pull back. The boy stepped back. You will never again fight alone, Dada. Never. Ganesh smiled and embraced his little brother once again, his eyes moist. The Naga noticed that Sati and Kali were silent. He looked up to see Parvateshwar turning towards the gate. Parvateshwar banged his right fist on his chest and bowed low, executing the Meluhan military salute. Ganesh turned in the direction Parvateshwar was facing. At the gate stood Shiva. Arms crossed across his chest, expression blank. His hair windswept and clothes fluttering in the breeze, staring at Ganesh. Ganesh, with Karthik still in his embrace, bowed low in respect to the Nilkant. When he straightened up, Shiva was gone. He may not be such a bad man, Shiva, said Virbhadra. Exhaling the marijuana fumes softly, Shiva looked up with a deadpan expression. Nandi looked at Virbhadra in alarm, but Virbhadra was adamant. We don't know everything about him, Shiva. I spoke to Parshuram. It was Ganesh who assisted him, the one who helped him fight against the injustices he faced. Apparently, Parshuram had been grievously injured when the Brangas first attacked him. Ganesh found the wounded Brahman on the banks of the Madhumati and rescued him. On hearing Parshuram's terrible story, he also swore to support him in any way that he could. Shiva simply took the chillam from Virbhadra and took a deep drag, not saying a word. You know what Kritika said? Ganesh fought like a man possessed to save Karthik, nearly sacrificing his own life in the process. Kritika is a good judge of character. She says that Ganesh has a heart of gold. Shiva kept quiet, exhaling smoke. I heard from Queen Kali, continued Virbhadra, that it was Ganesh who arranged for the Naga medicine which saved Karthik's life during his birth. Shiva looked up, surprised. He narrowed his eyes. He is a strange man. I don't know what to make of him. He has saved my son's life. Twice, if I am to believe you. He saved my wife's life in a chavar. For all this, I must love him. But when I look at him, I hear Brihaspati's desperate cry for help ring in my ears. And then, I want nothing more than to cut off his head. Virbhadra looked down, unhappy. The Nilkant shook his head. But I know of a man that I definitely want answers from. Virbhadra looked up at him. Suspecting his friend's train of thought, his highness, yes, said Shiva. Kali and Ganesh could not have been abandoned without his consent. Nandi piped up for his emperor, but my lord, the emperor Daksha had no choice. That is the law. Naga children cannot live in Meluha. Well, isn't it also the law that the Naga's mother has to leave society? That the mother should be told the truth about her child? Asked Shiva. Laws cannot be applied selectively. Nandi kept quiet. I don't doubt the love the emperor has for Sati, said Shiva. But didn't he realize how much he was going to end up hurting Sati by banishing her son? Virbhadra nodded. He hid this fact from her all her life. He even hid her twin sister's existence. I always thought the way he examined Karthik's body at birth was strange. Now it makes sense. He acted as though he was almost expecting another Naga. Hmm, said Virbhadra. And I have a dirty feeling that this is not where the story ends. What do you mean? I suspect that Chandan Dwaj did not die naturally. Her first husband? Yes. It is just too convenient that he drowned the day Ganesh was born. My lord! Nandi spoke up in shock. But that cannot be true. This is a crime. No Suryavanshi ruler will ever stoop so low. I am not saying that I know for sure, Nandi, said Shiva. It is just a feeling that I have. Remember, nobody is good or bad. They are either strong or weak. Strong people stick to their morals, no matter what the trials and tribulations. 
weak people many a times do not even realize how low they have sunk nandi kept quiet veerbhadra looked straight at shiva i will not be surprised if what you suspect is true it may have been his highness's twisted way of thinking that he is doing sati a favor chapter 21 the mica mystery it had been nearly 3 months since ganesh had saved kartik's life though still limping he had recovered enough to know that he had to go back to panchvati he had been conscious for a month now each waking moment reminded him of the torment in his mother's heart the rift between shiva and sati was more than he could bear as far as he knew the only way out was for him to leave let's leave tomorrow mossy said ganesh have you told your mother asked kali i intend to just leave a note for her kali narrowed her eyes she will not let me go even though she must kali took a deep breath So you are just going to forget her? Ganesh smiled sadly. I have got enough love from her in the past few months to last me a lifetime. I can live on my memories, but she cannot live without the Neil Kant. A puzzled Shiva rose to receive Atithigva. The Kashi king had never stepped into the Branga quarters before. He had always waited for the Neil Kant outside. What is the matter your highness? My lord, I just received word that Emperor Daksha is on his way to Kashi. Shiva frowned. I don't understand the urgency. If you have received word today, I am sure the emperor will not be here for another 2 or 3 months. No, my lord, he is coming today. In a few hours, I just received word from an advance party. Shiva raised his eyebrows, surprised beyond words. My lord said Atithigva I want to request you to come to the throne room to take your rightful place so that we may receive the emperor I'll come said Shiva but please ensure that only you are there I do not want to receive him along with your courtiers this was unorthodox Atithigva frowned but didn't question Shiva's unusual demand he simply left to carry out the orders Nandi word may have been sent to Parvateshwar and Bhagirath as well said Shiva please tell them it is my wish that they do not come to the court right now we will have a ceremonial welcome for his highness a little later yes my lord nandi saluted and left veerbhadra whispered to shiva you think he knows no if i know anything about him He wouldn't have come had he known that Kali and Ganesh were here. He has come in haste without regard for protocol. It is the action of a father, not an emperor. He was probably missing Sati and Kartik. What do you want to do? Let it go or discover the truth? No way will I let it go. I want to know the truth. Veerbhadra nodded. I hope for the sake of Sati, said Shiva, that my suspicions are wrong. but he knew nothing but the only thing that happened was that mica's administrators followed the law but you fear your right asked veerbhadra yes any idea how we can find out what actually happened that day confront him catch him by surprise this is the perfect time veerbhadra frowned i intend to spring kali and ganesh on him said shiva His face will tell me the rest. What is his highness doing here? asked Parvateshwar. Nobody told me of his plans. How can Kashi do this? This is a breach of protocol. Nobody knew of this, my lord, said Nandi. Even King Atithigva got to know of it right now. Meluha sent no intimation earlier. Parvateshwar looked flabbergasted. Such slips in Meluhan diplomatic procedures was unheard of. Bagirath shrugged his shoulders. <laughs> All kings are alike. Parvateshwar ignored the jibe aimed at the ruler of his realm about his lack of etiquette and protocol. He spoke to Nandi. Why does the Lord Neelkant not want us to come to the throne room? 
I couldn't say, my lord, replied Nandi. I'm just following orders. Parvateshwar nodded. All right. We'll stay here till the lord calls us. Shiva can have any number of reasons for wanting to meet Kali. But why Ganesh? What's going on? Asked Sati, frowning. Virbhadra was stumped. Not only was Ganesh in Kali's chamber, but so was Sati. Considering that Daksha was already in Kashi, he had to get Kali and Ganesh into the throne room as fast as he could. It was entirely possible that Daksha might find out about the presence of his Naga daughter and grandson. Time was of the essence. If their surprise meeting had to work, it had to happen now. Virbhadra had no choice but to announce Shiva's summons to Kali and Ganesh. I am just following orders, my lady. Following orders doesn't mean you don't know what's going on. He wants them to see something. Bhadra, said Sati, my husband is your best friend. You are married to my best friend. I know you. I know that you know more. I am not letting my son go till you tell me. Virbhadra shook his head at Sati's doggedness. He could see what drew Shiva to Sati, despite their temporary estrangement. My lady, your father is here. Sati was surprised, partly at the unannounced appearance of her father, but more so at Shiva summoning Kali and Ganesh to meet Daksha. Somewhere in his heart, Shiva actually believes injustice has been done to my son and sister. Um, do you want to go? Sati asked Kali. The Naga queen narrowed her eyes, hand tightening on her sword hilt. Yes, even wild horses couldn't keep me away. Sati turned to her son. He didn't want a confrontation. He didn't want the truth to come out, to hurt his mother even more. He shook his head. Kali spoke up in surprise. Why? What are you afraid of? I, I don't want this, Mossy, replied Ganesh. But I do, said Sati. Your existence was hidden from me for 90 years. But those were the rules, Ma, said Ganesh. No, the rules are that a Naga child cannot live in Maluha. Hiding the truth from the mother is not part of these rules. If I knew, I would have left Maluha with you. Even if the rule was broken, it's in the past. Please, Ma, forget it. I will not. I cannot. I want to know how much he knew. And if he did know, why did he lie? To protect his name? So that no one can accuse him of being the progenitor of Nagas? So that he can continue to rule? Ma, nothing will come of this, said Ganesh. Kali started laughing. Ganesh turned to her in irritation. When you were scouring all of India to confront Sati, I had told you this very thing, said Kali. And what had you said? You wanted answers. That you would not be at peace till you knew the truth about your relationship with your mother. That it would complete you. Then why can't your mother want or expect the same from her father? But this is not completion, Mossy, said Ganesh. This is only confrontation and pain. Completion is completion, my child, said Kali. Sometimes completion causes happiness and sometimes pain. Your mother has a right to do this. Saying so, Kali turned to Sati. Are you sure you want to do this, Devi? I want answers, said Sati. Virbhadra gulped. My lady, Shiva only asked for Queen Kali and Lord Ganesh, not you. I'm coming, Bhadra, said Sati. And you know very well that I must. Virbhadra looked down. Sati was right. She had the right to be there. Ma, whispered Ganesh. Ganesh, I am going, said Sati firmly. You can either come or not. That is your choice, but you cannot stop me. The Lord of the People took a deep breath pulled his Angavastram on his shoulder and said, Lead us on, brave Virbhadra. What a pleasant surprise to see you, Your Highness, said Atithigva, bowing to the Emperor of India. Daksha nodded as he entered the antechamber of the court. 
It is my empire, Atitigva. I think I can throw in a surprise or two. Atitigva smiled. Daksha had his wife Virni in tow. She, in turn, was trailed by the famed Arishtanemi warriors, Maya Shrenik and Vidyun Mali. With Parvateshwar's absence from Swadweep, Maya Shrenik had been appointed Provisional General of Meluha's armed forces. Daksha was surprised when he entered the main throne room, as the usual courtly nobles and officials were absent. Only Shiva and Nandi were present. Nandi immediately brought his fist up to his chest and bowed low to his emperor. Daksha smiled at Nandi genially. Shiva remained seated, joining his hands in a namaste. Welcome to Kashi, your highness. Daksha's smile disappeared. He was the emperor of all of India. He deserved respect. Even if Shiva was the Nilkant, protocol demanded that he stand up for the emperor. In the past, Shiva had always done so. This was an insult. How are you, my son-in-law? said Daksha, trying to keep his anger in check. I am well, your highness. Why don't you sit next to me? Daksha sat. So did Virni and Atitigva. Turning to Atitigva, Daksha said, For such a noisy city, you seem to be running a very quiet court, Atitigva. Atitigva smiled. No, my lord, it's just that... My apologies for interrupting, your highness, said Shiva to Atitigva, before turning to Daksha. I thought it would be a good idea for you to meet your children in private. Virni perked up immediately. Where are they, Lord Nilkant? Just then, Virbhadra walked in, followed by Sati. My child, said a smiling Daksha, forgetting the slight from Shiva. Why didn't you bring my grandson along? I did, said Sati. Ganesh entered the room. Behind him was Kali. Shiva was staring hard at Daksha's face. The Meluhan Emperor's eyes sprung wide open in recognition. His jaw dropped in shock. He knows. Then Daksha swallowed hard, straightening up. He's afraid. He is hiding something. Shiva also noticed Virani's expression. Profound sadness. Eyebrows joined together, but her lips curled up slightly in a smile, struggling to break through, her eyes moist. She knows too, and she loves them. Daksha turned to Atitigva and blustered. How dare you consort with terrorists, King of Kashi? They are not terrorists, said Sati. Terrorists kill innocent people. Kali and Ganesh have never done that. Does Sati speak for the King of Kashi now? Don't speak to him, father, said Sati. Speak to me. What for? asked Daksha, pointing at Ganesh and Kali. What do you have to do with them? Everything. Their place is with me. Should have always been with me. What? While Nagas have only one place, south of the Narmada. They are not allowed into the Sat Sindhu. My sister and son are not vile. They are my blood. Your blood. Daksha stood, stepping up to Sati. Sister, son, what nonsense. Don't believe the rubbish these come tell you. Of course they hate me. They will say anything to malign me. I am their sworn enemy. I am the ruler of Meluha, under oath to destroy them. Kali reached for her sword. I am in the mood to challenge you to an Agni Pariksha right now, you repulsive goat. Don't you have any shame? Daksha shouted at Kali. Do penance for your past life sins quietly, instead of creating bad blood between a loving father and his daughter. What lies have you told her about me? They haven't said a word, father, said Sati. But their existence says a lot about you. It's not me. They exist because of your mother. Her past life sins have led to this. We never had Nagas in our family before her. Sati's jaw fell. She was seeing the levels to which her father could stoop to for the first time. Virini was staring hard at Daksha, silent anger smoldering in her eyes. This is not about past lives, father, said Sati. It's about this life. You knew, yet you didn't tell me. I am your father, 
I have loved you all my life. I have fought the world for you. Will you trust me or some deformed animals? They are not deformed animals. They are my family. You want to make these people your family? People who lie to you, who turn you against your own father? They never lied to me. Shouted Sati. You did. No, I did not. You said my son was stillborn. Daksha took a deep breath, looked up at the ceiling as though struggling to regain control, and then glared at Sati. Why don't you understand? I lied for your own good. Do you know what your life would have been like if you had been declared a Naga's mother? I would be with my son. What rubbish! What would you have done? Lived in Panchvati? Yes. You are my daughter! Screamed Daksha. I have always loved you more than anyone else. I would never have allowed you to suffer in Panchvati. It was not your choice to make. An exasperated Daksha turned to Shiva. Talk some sense into her, Lord Nilkant. Shiva's eyes were narrowed. He wanted to know how wide this web of deception spread. Did you get Chandan Thwaj killed, Your Highness? Daksha blanched. Fear was written all over his face. He looked sharply at Sati and then quickly back at Shiva. Oh, Lord, he did. Sati was reeling, shocked into absolute silence. Kali and Ganesh did not seem surprised. Daksha immediately regained control. He pointed a finger at Shiva, his body shaking. You did this. You choreographed this. Shiva stayed quiet. You have turned my daughter against me, screamed Daksha. Maharishi Bhrigu was right. The evil Vasudevs control you. Shiva continued to stare at Daksha, as if actually seeing him for the first time. Daksha was boiling. What were you? A stupid tribal from a barbaric land? I made you the Nilkant. I gave you power. I gave it to you so that you would bring the Chandravanshis under Meluhan control, so that I could establish peace in India. And you dare to use the power I bestowed upon you against me? Shiva remained passive, making Daksha spew even more venom. I made you, and I can destroy you. Daksha pulled his knife out and lunged forward. Nandi jumped in front of Shiva, taking the blow on his shield. His Meluhan training didn't allow him to draw his sword at his monarch. Kali and Ganesh, however, had no such compunctions, drawing their blades rapidly on Daksha. Ganesh jumped in front of Shiva, even as Vidyan Mali drew his sword. Maya Shrenik, a loyal Meluhan who would have fought to death for his king, was stunned into inaction. He was deeply devoted to Shiva. How could he draw his sword against the Nilkant? Calm down, said Shiva, raising his hand. Vidyan Mali still had his sword drawn. Daksha's knife had fallen to the ground. Shiva spoke once again. Nandi, Ganesh, Kali, stand down! Now! As Shiva's warriors lowered their swords, Vidyan Mali also sheathed his blade. Your Highness, Shiva addressed Daksha. Daksha's eyes were glued on a teary-eyed Sati, who had a sword inches away from her father's throat. His face exhibited the sense of betrayal and the loss he felt. Sati was the only person he had ever truly loved. Sati, whispered Shiva, please put it down. He's not worth it. Sati sword inched closer. Shiva stepped forward slowly. Sati? Her hands were shaking slightly, rage driving her dangerously close to the edge. Shiva touched her shoulder lightly. Sati? Put it down. Shiva's touch brought Sati back from the precipice. She lowered her sword a little. Her eyes narrowed, her breathing heavy, her body stiff. Daksha continued to stare at Sati. I am ashamed that your blood runs in my veins, said Sati. Tears began to flow down Daksha's face. Get out, whispered Sati through gritted teeth. Daksha was deathly still. Get out! 
Virini got a jolt from Sati's loud voice, her expression a mix of sadness and anger. She walked up to Daksha. Move. Daksha stood paralyzed, shocked at this turn of events. Come on. Virini repeated louder, pulling her husband by his arm. Maya Shrenik, Vidyun Mali, let's leave. The Empress of India dragged her husband out of the room. Sati was shattered. She dropped her sword, tears streaming down her face. Ganesh rushed towards her, but Shiva caught her even as she fell. Sati was sobbing uncontrollably as Shiva picked her up in his arms. Chapter 22 Two Sides, Same Coin So, what are you thinking? asked Kali. Ganesh and Kali were in the Naga Queen's quarters. After the drama that had unfolded earlier in the day, Shiva had carried Sati over to their room in Atitigwa's palace. Daksha, Virani and their entourage had departed immediately for the Meluhan capital, Devagiri. This was unexpected, said a pensive Ganesh with a slight smile. Kali raised her eyes. Sometimes your stoicism is very irritating. Ganesh smiled. A rare broad smile from one floppy ear to the other. His extended teeth stretching further out. Now that's the face I want to see more of, said Kali. You actually look cute. Ganesh's face turned serious again. He raised a papyrus scroll, a message from Panchvati. I would have been laughing, Mossy, but for this. What now? asked Kali, frowning. It's a failure. Again? Yes, again. But I thought... We thought wrong, Mossy. Kali cursed. Ganesh stared at his aunt. He could feel her frustration. A final solution was so close, its success would have completed their victory. Now, there was every chance that everything they had done would be lost. Do we try again? asked Kali. I think we have to finally accept the truth, Mossy. This route is a dead end. We have no choice. The time has come to reveal the secret. Yes, said Kali. The Nilkant should know. The Nilkant? Asked Ganesh, surprised at how much had changed in such a short span. Kali frowned. You didn't use his name. You said the Nilkant. You believe the legend now? Kali smiled. I don't believe in legends. Never have, never will. But... I believe in him. How different would my life have been if fate had blessed me with a man like Shiva? Maybe like Didi, all the poison could have been sucked out of my life as well. Perhaps even I would have found happiness and peace. We have to show him the secret, said Ganesh, intruding into Kali's thoughts. Show him? I don't think it can be done here, right? He must see for himself. You want to take him to Panchavati? Why not? Asked Ganesh. Don't you trust him? Of course, I do. I would trust him with my life. But he doesn't come alone. Some others come with him. If we take them along, they will know how to get to Panchavati. This will weaken our defenses. I think people like Parvateshwar and Bhagirath can be trusted, Mossy. I don't think they will ever go against the Nilkant. They would give their lives for him. If there is one thing I have learnt in life, said Kali. It is that no one should spread one's trust too far and never take things for granted. Ganesh frowned. If you doubt all his followers, then what about Parshuram? He already knows the way. You know his devotion for the Nilkant. Remember, I had told you not to bring Parshuram to Panchavati, but you didn't listen. So now what, Mossy? We will take them through Branga. They will know how to get to Panchavati but only from Chandraketu's realm. They will never be able to reach us directly from their own kingdoms. The forests of Dandak would consume them even if they try. We can trust the Brangas not to let anyone pass without our permission. Even Parashuram doesn't know any other way. Ganesh nodded. That is a good idea. Thank the Lord I didn't do anything rash that I would regret later said Sati. Shiva was sitting on a long chair in the balcony of their chambers. Sati was on his lap, 
her head leaning against his muscular chest, her eyes swollen red. From the heights of the Kashi Palace, the Sacred Avenue and the Vishwanath Temple were clearly visible. Beyond them flowed the mighty Ganga. Your anger was justified, my darling. Sati looked up at her husband, breathing slowly. Aren't you angry? He just tried to kill you. Shiva stared into his wife's eyes as he ran his hand across her face. My anger towards your father is because of what he did to you, not what he tried to do to me. But how dare Vidyun Mali draw his sword on you? Whispered Sati. Thank God Ganesh w- Sati stopped, afraid that her taking Ganesh's name would ruin this moment. Shiva gave her a gentle squeeze. He's your son. Sati kept quiet, body stiff, feeling the intense pain that Shiva felt at Brihaspati's loss. Shiva held Sati's face and looked straight into her eyes. No matter how hard I try, I cannot hate a part of your soul. Sati sighed as fresh tears escaped silently from her eyes. She held Shiva tight. Shiva did not want to spoil the moment as he held on to his wife. One thing continued to puzzle him. Who is Bhrigu? The emperor had Chandandwaj killed? Asked a shocked Parvateshwar. Yes, general, said Veerbhadra. Parvateshwar, numb with shock, looked at Anandmai and Bhagirath, then back at Veerbhadra. Where is his highness now? He is on his way back to Meluha, my lord, said Veerbhadra. Parvateshwar held his head. His emperor had brought dishonor to Meluha, his motherland. He couldn't even imagine the pain this revelation must have caused to the woman he had always looked upon as the daughter he had never had. Where is Sati? She is with Shiva, my lord. Anandmai looked at Parvateshwar with a smile. At least, some good had come out of this sordid episode. The Meluhan royal ship cruised slowly up the Ganga. Four ships sailing around it in the standard Surivanshi defensive naval protocol. Daksha's entourage was on its way home, a day away from Kashi. Maya Shrenik was in the lead boat, maintaining a steady pace. He was still shaken by the incidents at Kashi. He hoped his emperor Daksha and the Nilkant would reconcile their differences. He wished to avoid the terrible fate of having to choose between his loyalty to his country and his devotion to his god. Vidyun Mali was in charge of security on Daksha's ship. He wanted to safeguard against any assassination attempt upon his emperor by the followers of the Nilkant. Even though it seemed unlikely, he wanted to take all the possible precautions. Virani sat in the royal chambers of the central ship, next to a window, watching the Ganga lap against the ship. She sensed that she had lost all her children now. She turned in anger towards her husband. Daksha was lying on the bed, eyes forlorn, a lost look on his face. It wasn't the first time he had faced and been overpowered by such terrible circumstances. Virini shook her head and turned to look out again. If only he had listened to me. Virini remembered that incident so clearly, it was as if it had happened just yesterday. Almost every day, she wondered how her life would have been if things had turned out differently. It had happened more than a hundred years ago. Sati had just returned from the Maika Gurukul, a headstrong, idealistic girl of sixteen. In keeping with her character, she had jumped in to save an immigrant woman from a vicious pack of wild dogs. Parvateshwar and Daksha had rushed in to her rescue. While they had managed to push back the dogs, Daksha had been seriously injured. Virani had accompanied Daksha to the Ayurale, where the doctors could examine her husband. The most worrying injury was on his left leg where a dog had ripped out some flesh, cutting through a major blood vessel. The loss of blood had made Daksha lose consciousness. When he had opened his eyes after a few hours, Daksha's first thought was of his young daughter. Sati, 
She is with Parvateshwar, said Virini, as she came closer to her husband and held his hand. Don't worry about her. I screamed at her. I didn't mean to. I know. She was only doing her duty. She did the right thing, trying to protect that woman. I'll tell her that. No, no. I still think she shouldn't have risked her life for that woman. I didn't mean to scream at her. That's all. Virni's eyes narrowed to slits. Her husband couldn't be any less Suryavanshi. She was about to say something when the door opened and Brahmanayak walked in. Brahmanayak. Daksha's father and ruler of Meluha was a tall, imposing figure, long black hair, a well manicured beard, a practically hairless body, a sober crown, and understated white clothes could not camouflage the indomitable spirit of the man. He set impossible standards for all those around him with his own great deeds. He was not just respected, but also feared in all of Meluha. Obsessive about the honor and respect that his empire should garner, his son's lack of courage and character was a source of anger and dismay for him. Virini immediately rose and stepped back quietly. Brahmanayak never spoke to her unless to give orders. Behind Brahmanayak was the kindly doctor who had stitched up Daksha's leg after the severe mauling it had received. Brahmanayak. In a matter-of-fact manner, lifted the sheet to look at his son's leg. There was a bandage of neem leaves tied around it. The doctor smiled genially. Your Highness, your son will be back on his feet in a week or two. I have been very careful. The scars will be minimal. Daksha looked for a brief instant at his father. Then, with his chest puffed up, he whispered, "But no, doctor. Scars are the pride of any Kshatriya." Brahmanayak snorted. What would you know about being a Kshatriya? Daksha fell silent. Virni began seething with anger. You let some dogs do this to you? Asked Brahmanayak contemptuously. I am the laughing stock of Meluha, perhaps even the world. My son cannot even kill a dog all by himself. Daksha kept staring at his father. To prevent a further escalation of hostility and to safeguard the patient's mental health, the doctor cut in. Your Highness, I need to discuss something with you. Uh, may we talk outside? Brahmanayak nodded. I haven't finished, he said, turning to Daksha before walking out of the chamber. A livid Virini stepped up to her husband, who was crying now. How long are you going to tolerate this? Daksha suddenly turned ferocious. He is my father. Speak of him with respect. He does not care about you, Daksha," said Virini. "All he cares about is his legacy. You don't even want to be king. So what are we doing here? My duty. I have to stay by his side. I am his son. He doesn't think so. You are only someone to carry forward his name, his legacy. That's all." Daksha fell silent. He has forced you to give up one daughter. How much more are you going to sacrifice? She is not my daughter. She is. Kali is as much your flesh and blood as Sati. I am not discussing this again. You have thought about it so many times. For once, have the courage to follow through. What will we do in Panchwati? Doesn't matter. What matters is what we'll be. Daksha shook his head. And what do you think we will be? We'll be happy. But I cannot leave Sati behind. Who's asking you to leave her behind? All I want is to unite my family. What? Why should Sati live in Panchwati? She is not a Naga. You and I have past life sins that have to be atoned. Sins for which we have been punished. Why should she be punished? The real punishment is the separation from her sister. And the real punishment is to see her father being humiliated every day. Daksha remained silent, wavering. Daksha, trust me," said Virini. "We'll be happy in Panchvati. If there was any other place where we could live with both Kali and Sati, I would suggest that. But there isn't." Daksha breathed deeply. But how? You leave that to me. I'll make the arrangements. 
Just say yes. Your father is leaving tomorrow for Karachapa. You are not so badly injured that you cannot travel. We'll be in Panchavati before he knows you're gone. Daksha stared at Virani. But... Trust me. Please, trust me. It will be for all our good. I know you love me. I know you love your daughters. I know you don't care about anything else. Just trust me. Daksha nodded. Virani smiled, bent closer and kissed her husband. I will make the arrangements. A happy Virani turned and walked out of the room. She had a lot to do. As she stepped out, she saw Sati and Parvatesh were sitting outside. She patted Sati on her head. Go in, my child. Tell your father how much you love him. He needs you. I'll be back soon. As Virani was hurrying away, she saw Brahmanayak walking back towards her husband's chamber. The Meluhan queen was jolted back to the present by some dolphin calls. The more than a century old memory still drew a tear from her eyes. She turned to look at her husband and shook her head. She had never really understood what happened that day. What had Brahmanayak said? All she knew was that when she had gone back to Daksha's chamber the next day with their escape plans, he had refused to leave. He had decided that he wanted to become emperor. Your stupid ego and need for approval from your father destroyed our lives. The secret? asked Shiva, recalling his conversation with Parshuram. Shiva was sitting with Parshuram, Parvateshwar, Veerbhadra and Nandi. Kali had just entered the chamber. Ganesh, still unsure of his position vis-a-vis -vis Shiva, was standing quietly at the back. Shiva had acknowledged Sati's elder son with a short nod, nothing more. Yes, I think you need to know, said Kali. It is India's need that the Nilkant knows the secret the Nagas have been keeping. Then you can decide whether what we have done is right or wrong. Decide what must be done now. Why can't you tell me here? I need you to trust me. I can't. Shiva's eyes bored into Kali's. He could see no malice or deceit in them. He felt he could trust her. How many days will it take to reach Panchvati? A little more than a year, answered Kali. A year? Yes, Lord Nilkant. We will travel up to Branga by river boats, ride down the Madhumati River, then travel by foot through the Dandakaranya. The journey takes time. There is no direct route? Kali smiled, but refused to be drawn in. She didn't want to reveal the secrets of the forest of Dandak. It was the primary defense for her city. I am trusting you, but it appears that you don't trust me. I trust you completely, Lord Nilkant. Shiva smiled, understanding Kali's predicament. She could trust him, but not everyone with him. All right, let's go to Panchavati. It is, perhaps, the route I have to take in order to discharge my duty. Shiva turned to Parvateshwar. Can you make the arrangements, General? It will be done, my lord, said Parvateshwar. Kali bowed towards Shiva and turned to leave, stretching her hand out to Ganesh. And Kali, said Shiva. Kali spun around. I prefer Shiva, not Nilkant. You are my wife's sister. You are family. Kali smiled and bowed her head. As you wish, Shiva. Shiva and Sati were at the Vishwanath temple. They had come to perform a private puja, seeking Lord Rudra's blessings. Having completed their prayers, they sat against one of the pillars of the temple, looking out towards the idol of Lady Mohini, whose statue was at the back of Lord Rudra's idol. Shiva reached out for his wife's hand and kissed it lightly. She smiled and rested her head on his shoulder. A very intriguing lady, said Shiva. Sati looked up at her husband. Lady Mohini? Yes. Why isn't she universally accepted as a Vishnu? Why has the number of Vishnu stopped at seven? There may be more Vishnus in the future, but not everyone regards her as a Vishnu. Do you? At one point of time, I didn't.
but now i have come to understand her greatness shiva frowned it's not easy to understand her said sati there were many things which she did which can be considered unjust it does not matter if she did those things to the asuras they were still unfair to the suryavanshis who follow the absolutes of lord ram she is difficult to understand so what's changed now i have come to know more of her about why she did what she did so i still don't appreciate some of the things that she did but perhaps i have more compassion for her actions vasudev had once told me that they believe lord rudra could not have completed his mission without her support sati looked at shiva they may be right maybe just maybe sometimes a small sin can lead to a greater good shiva stared at sati he could see where she was going with this if a man has been good all his life despite the unkindness he has faced if he has helped others we should try to understand why he committed what appears to be a sin we may not be able to forgive him but we may be able to understand him shiva knew sati was talking about ganesh do you understand why he did what he did sati took a deep breath no shiva turned his gaze towards lady mohini's statue sati pulled shiva's face back towards her sometimes it's difficult to understand an event without knowing everything that led up to it shiva turned his face away he shut his eyes and breathed deeply he saved your life he saved kartik's life for that i must love him he has done so much to make me think that he is a good man sati remained silent but shiva took a deep breath but it's not easy for me sati i just can't sati sighed perhaps going to panchavati may make everything clear my lord what are you saying how can i asked a flabbergasted dilipa he was sitting at maharishi bhrigu's feet in his private chambers in his palace at ayodhya prime minister siamantak had become a past master at keeping bhrigu's frequent visits to ayodhya a secret the maharishi's medicines were working their magic dilipa was looking healthier with every passing day are you refusing to help your highness bhrigu's voice was menacing eyes narrowed no my lord of course not but this is impossible i will show you the way but how can i do it all by myself you will have allies i'll guarantee that but such an attack as this what if someone finds out my own people will turn against me nobody will find out dilipa looked disturbed what have i got myself into why why is this needed maharishi ji for the good of india dilipa remained silent worry lines on his face bhrigu knew the self obsessed dilipa would not particularly care about the larger cause so he decided to make it very personal you also need to do this your highness if you want to prevent disease from eating up your body dilipa stared at bhrigu the threat was clear and overt he bowed his head tell me how maharishi ji within 2 months of the naga queen's request to shiva parvateshwar had made arrangements for travelling to panchvati shiva's entourage had grown considerably since the time he had sailed into the city where the supreme light shines accompanying shiva on the voyage was his entire family as the mahadev refused to leave sati and kartik behind kali and ganesh obviously had to be there veerbhadra and nandi were fixtures on the nilkanth's retinue and veerbhadra had insisted on his wife kritika accompanying him this time not just because they missed each other but also as he knew she would not be able to bear parting company from kartik for so long Ayurvati was the obvious choice for the physician on board. Shiva also wanted Bhagirath and Parshuram with him, and Parvateshwar, his general and security head, could not leave without Anandmayee. Parvateshwar had arranged for two brigades to travel with them, 
So 2,000 soldiers, both Chandravanshi and Suryavanshi, traveled in a fleet of nine ships along with the royal vessel carrying the Nilkant and his close aides. Vishwadyumna, the royal Branga follower of Ganesh, and his platoon were also commissioned into the Chandravanshi brigade. They sailed slowly so they could keep all the ships together. Two months had passed since they had left Kashi when they neared Vaishali. Remembering his conversation with Gopal, the chief of the Vasudevs, Shiva turned towards Virbhadra, Nandi and Parshuram. All of them, except Nandi, were smoking pot on the deck, contemplating the river. Apparently, Lord Manu had said, Good and evil are two sides of the same coin, said Shiva, breaking the silence of the moment, taking the chillam from Parshuram. Parshuram frowned. I have heard this too. But I could never make sense of it. Shiva took a deep drag of the marijuana, exhaled and passed the chillam to Virbhadra. What do you make of it, Bhadra? Frankly, a lot of what your Vasudev friend says mumbo-jumbo. Shiva burst out laughing. So did his friends. <laughs> I wouldn't quite say that, brave Virbhadra. A surprised Shiva turned around to find Ganesh behind them. Shiva fell silent, all traces of humor dropping from him. Parshuram immediately bowed his head to Ganesh, but did not say anything out of fear of angering the Nilkant. Virbhadra, who was growing increasingly fond of the Lord of the people and believed him to be a man of integrity, asked, So what do you make of it, Ganesh? I would think it's a clue, said Ganesh, smiling at Virbhadra. Clue? asked Shiva, intrigued. Maybe for the Nilkant to understand what he should be searching for? Carry on. Good and evil are two sides of the same coin. So the Nilkant has to find one side of a coin, right? Shiva frowned. Is it possible to find one side of a coin? asked Ganesh. Shiva slapped his forehead. Of course. Search for the whole coin instead. Ganesh nodded, smiling. Shiva stared at Ganesh. A germ of an idea was forming in the Nilkant's mind. Search for good, and you shall find evil as well. The greater the good, the greater the evil. Virbhatra held out the chillam to Ganesh. Would you like to try some? Ganesh had never smoked in his life. He looked at his father and couldn't read what was written in those deep, mysterious eyes. I would love to. Place it in your mouth like so, said Virbhadra, demonstrating by cupping his hands, and breathe in deeply. Ganesh did as he was told, collapsing in a severe bout of coughing. Everyone burst out laughing, except Shiva, who continued to stare at Ganesh, straight-faced. Virbhadra stretched out to pat Ganesh on his back and took the chillam away from him. Ganesh, you have never been touched by this evil. No, but I'm sure I'll grow to like it, smiled an embarrassed Ganesh, glancing for a moment at Shiva as he reached out for the chillam again. Virbhadra drew it out of reach. No, Ganesh, you should remain innocent. The fleet was at the gates of Branga. Parvateshwar Anandmai and Bhagirath had transferred into the lead ship to supervise operations. I've seen it before, I know, said Anandmai, staring at the gates. But I still get amazed at their sheer ingenuity. Parvateshwar smiled and put his arm around Anandmai. And almost immediately, much to Anandmai's annoyance, he turned back to the task at hand. Uthanka, the second ship is not high enough. Tell the Brangas to fill more water into the pool. Unnoticed by Parvateshwar, Anandmai raised her eyebrows and shook her head slightly. Then she turned her husband's face and kissed him lightly. Parvateshwar smiled. All right, you lovebirds, said Bhagirath. Keep a lid on it. Anandmai laughed and slapped her brother on his wrist. Parvateshwar smiled and turned towards the gates to supervise the crossing. This crossing will go well, General, said Bhagirath. Relax. We know what the Brangas are doing. There are no surprises here. Parvateshwar turned to Bhagirath with a frown. He was surprised the Ayodhyan prince had used the term general. 
He could tell his brother-in-law was trying to say something, but was being cautious. Out with it, Bhagirath. What are you trying to say? We know the path here, said Bhagirath. We know what the Brangas are doing. There will be no surprises. But we have no idea what route the Nagas will lead us on. Only the Almighty knows what surprises they may have in store. Is it wise to trust them so blindly? We're not trusting the Nagas, Bhagirath, interrupted Anandai. We are trusting the Nilkant. Parvateshwar remained silent. I'm not saying we shouldn't trust the Mahadev, said Bhagirath. How can I? But how much do we know of the Nagas? We are going through the dreaded Dandak forest with the Naga as our guides. Am I the only one concerned here? Listen, said an irritated Anandmai. Lord Nilkant trusts Queen Kali. That means I will trust her. And so will you. Bhagirath shook his head. What do you say, Parvateshwar? The Lord is my Lord. I will walk into a wall of flames if he orders me to, said Parvateshwar as he looked towards the banks where accumulator machines had just been released, pulling their ship forward with tremendous force. The Meluhan general turned to Bhagirath. But how can I forget that Ganesh killed Brahaspati, the greatest scientist of Maluha, that he destroyed the heart of our empire, Mount Mandar? How can I trust him after all this? Ananvai looked at Parvateshwar and then at her brother uncomfortably. No, Kritika, said Ayurvati. I am not doing it. Kritika and Ayurvati were in the Meluhan doctor's office on the royal ship. The hooks on the sideboards of their ship were being attached onto the machine that would pull it through the gates of Branga. Practically everyone on the vessel was on the deck to see this marvelous feat of Branga engineering in action. Kritika had used the time to meet Ayurvati without Veerbhadra's knowledge. Ayurvati ji, please, you know I need it. No, you don't. And I'm sure if your husband knew, he would say no as well. He doesn't need to know. Kritika, I am not going to do anything to put your life in danger. Is that clear? Ayurvati turned around to prepare a medicine for Karthik. He had cut himself while practicing with Parvateshwar. Kritika saw her chance. There was a pouch lying on Ayurvati's table. She knew this was the medicine she desperately craved. She slipped it quietly into the folds of her Angvastram. My apologies for disturbing you, said Kritika. Ayurvati turned around. I'm sorry if I appear rude, Kritika, but it is in your own interest. Please, don't tell my husband. Of course not, said Ayurvati. But you should tell Veerabhadra yourself, right? Kritika nodded and was about to leave the room when Ayurvati called out to her. Pointing towards Kritika's Angavastram, Ayurvati said, Please, leave it behind. Embarrassed, Kritika slowly slipped her hand into her Angavastram, took the pouch out and left it on the table. She looked up, eyes moist and pleading. Ayurvati held Kritika's shoulder gently. Haven't you learned anything from the Nilkant? You are a complete woman exactly the way you are. Your husband loves you for who you are and not for something you can give him. Kritika mumbled a soft apology and ran from the room. Chapter 23 The Secret of All Secrets The convoy crossed the gates of Branga and sailed into the river's westernmost distributary, the Mathumati. A few weeks later, they passed the spot where Shiva had battled with Parshuram. This is where we fought Parshuram, said Shiva, patting the ex-bandit on his back. Parshuram looked at Shiva and then at Sati. Actually, this is where the Lord saved me. Sati smiled at Parshuram. She knew what it felt like being saved by Shiva. She looked at her husband with love. A man capable of pulling the poison out of the lives of all those around him. And yet, he couldn't pull the poison out of his own memories, still being tortured by his own demons. No matter how hard she tried, she could not get him to forget his past. Perhaps that was his fate. Sati's musings were interrupted by Parshuram. 
This is where we turn, my lord. Sati looked in the direction the exiled Vasudev pointed. There was nothing there. The river seemed to skirt a large grove of Sundari trees and carry on towards the eastern sea. Where? asked Shiva. See those uh, Sundari trees, my lord? said Parshuram, pointing towards a grove with the hook fixed on his amputated left hand. They lend their name to this area, the Sundarban. Beautiful forest? asked Sati. Yes, my lady, said Parshuram. They also hide a beautiful secret. On the orders of Kali, the lead ship turned into the grove that Parshuram had pointed towards. From the distance of her own ship, Sati could see the figure of Parvateshwar also on the deck, looking at Kali and trying to argue with the Naga queen. Kali simply ignored him, and the ship continued on a course that appeared to be its doom. What are they doing? asked Sati, panic-stricken. They'll run aground. To their shock, the lead ship simply pushed the trees aside and sailed through. By the holy lake, whispered an awestruck Shiva. Rootless trees. Not rootless, my lord, corrected Parshuram. They have roots, but not fixed ones. The roots float in the lagoon. But how can such trees live? asked Sati. That is something I have not understood, said Parshuram. Perhaps it's the magic of the Nagas. The other ships, led by the royal ship that carried the Mahadev, glided into the floating grove of Sundari trees and entered a hidden lagoon where the gentle waves of the Madhumati came to a halt. Shiva looked around in wonder. The area was lush green, alive with raucous bird calls. The vegetation was dense, creating a canopy of leaves over the lagoon which was massive enough to hold ten large ships. It was nearing the end of the second prahar, and the sun was at its peak. Within the shaded lagoon, however, one could mistakenly think it was evening time. Parshuram looked at Shiva. Very few people know the location of the floating grove. I know of some who have tried to find it and have only run their ships aground. The ten ships were quickly anchored into the long stakes in the banks after being tied to each other and pulled behind a dense row of floating sundari trees. The vessels were secure and completely hidden from view. The path now was on foot. More than two thousand soldiers had to troop through the Dandak forests. They were all asked to assemble on and around the lead ship. Kali climbed up the main mast so that all could see her. Hear me. The crowd quietened down. Kali's voice instantly commanded compliance. All of you have heard rumors of the Dandakaranya, that the Dandak forest is the largest in the world, that it stretches from the eastern to the western sea, that it is so dense the sun hardly ever cracks through, that it is populated by monstrous animals that will devour those who lose their way that some trees themselves are poisonous, felling those stupid enough to eat or touch things better left alone. The soldiers looked at Kali with concern. The rumors are all true. Horrifyingly so. The soldiers knew the Dandak forest were to the south of the Narmada, the border mandated by Lord Manu, the border that was never to be crossed. Not only were they violating Lord Manu's orders, but they were also entering the terrifying Dandakaranya. None of them wanted to push their luck further by being adventurous in these cursed jungles. Kali's words only sealed their convictions. Only Ganesh, Vishwadyumna and I know the path through this death trap. If you want to stay alive, follow our orders and do as we tell you. In turn, I give you my word that you will all reach Panchavati alive. The soldiers nodded vigorously. For the rest of the day, rest on your ships, eat your fill and get some sleep. We leave tomorrow morning at sunrise. Nobody is to go exploring into the Sundarban by himself tonight. He may discover that these forests are more vicious than beautiful. Kali climbed down the mast to find Shiva and Sati below. How far is the Dandak forest from here? asked Sati. Kali looked around and then back at Sati. We are travelling in a large convoy. 
Normally the distance should take a month, but I suspect we will take two or three. I don't mind that though. I would rather be slow than dead. You have a way with words, sister. Kali smiled with unholy glee. Is Panchvati at the center of the Dandak forest? Asked Shiva. No, Shiva. It is more towards the western end. A long way. That is why I said it would take a long time. Once in the Dandakaranya, it will take another six months to reach Panchavati. Hmm, said Shiva. We should carry enough food from the ships. No need, Shiva, said Kali. Excess baggage will slow us down. The forests are replete with all the food we need. We just have to be careful that we don't eat something we shouldn't. But food isn't the only problem. We'll be spending nine months in the forest. There are many other threats. Kali's eyes lit up. Not if you are with me. Dinner had been served on the deck of the main ship. Shiva had decided to honor the Naga custom of community eating, where many people ate from one humongous plate stitched together from many banana tree leaves. Shiva, Sati, Kali, Ganesh, Kartik, Parvateshwar, Anandmai, Bhagirath, Ayurvati, Parshuram, Nandi, Virbhadra and Krithika sat around the massive plate. Parvateshwar found the custom odd and unhygienic, but as always, followed Shiva's orders. What is the reason behind this custom, Your Highness? asked Bhagirath to Kali. We Nagas believe Devi Annapurna, the goddess of food, is one of our collective mothers. For doesn't she keep us all alive? What this custom does is makes all of us receive her blessings together. We eat all our meals when traveling in this manner. We are brothers and sisters now. We share the same fate on the journey. That's true, said Bhagirath, simultaneously thinking that community eating was a good way to hedge against poisoning. Is it really that dangerous in Dandak, Your Highness? asked Parvateshwar. Or are these just rumors to ensure discipline? The forest can be abundant and caring, like an indulgent mother, if we follow her rules. But stray out of line and she can be like a demon who will strike you down. Yes, the rumors help ensure discipline. Nine months is a long time to stick to a fixed path, to not stray. But trust me, those who stray will find the rumors are based on hard Fact. All right, said Shiva. Enough of this. Let's eat. All this while, Ayurvati had been looking at Kritika and Virbhadra. Between bites, Virbhadra was pointing towards Karthik and whispering to his wife. They looked at Karthik with loving eyes, almost like he was their own son. Ayurvati smiled sadly. General said Virbhadra. Parvateshwar was clearly irritated. The two men were on the floating dock next to the lead ship, along with a hundred soldiers. At the lead were Kali and Ganesh. No road was visible. Dense bushes covered the path in every direction. Seeing Virbhadra, Parvateshwar calmed down. Is the Lord coming? No, General. Just me. Parvateshwar nodded. That's all right. And then he turned towards Kali. Your Highness, I hope you do not expect my men to hack their way through these bushes all the way to Panchavati. Even if I did, I am sure your Suryavanshi men would be able to do so very easily. Parvateshwar's eyes narrowed in irritation. My lady, I am at the end of my tether. You either give me some straight answers or I take my men and sail out of here. I don't know what to do to earn your trust, General. Have I done anything in this journey thus far to hurt your men? Kali pointed in a westerly direction. All I need your men to do now is to hack their way through these bushes for a hundred meters in that direction. That's it? That's it. Parvateshwar nodded. The soldiers immediately drew their swords and formed a line. Virbhadra joined them. They moved forward slowly, slashing through almost impenetrable bushes. Vishwadyumna and Ganesh were at the two ends of the line. Swords drawn facing outwards. It was obvious from their stance that they were protecting the men from some unknown danger. A little while later, 
Veerbhadra and the soldiers were surprised to emerge from the dense undergrowth onto a pathway. It was broad enough for ten horses riding side by side. Where in Lord Ram's name did this come from? asked an astonished Parvateshwar. The road to heaven, said Kali. But it passes through hell before that. Parvateshwar turned back to the Naga Queen. Kali smiled. I told you so. Trust me. Veerbhadra walked up and stared in wonder at the road ahead. It ran straight, right into the distance. A stony path, it had been leveled reasonably well. Along the sides, running parallel to the trees, were two continuous hedges of long thorny creepers. Are they poisonous? asked Parvateshwar, pointing at the twin fences. The inside one next to the road is made of Nagavalli creeper, said Kali. You can even eat the leaves if you like. But the hedge on the outside facing the forest is highly toxic. If you get pricked by its thorns, you will not even have time to say your last prayers. Parvateshwar raised his eyebrows. How did they build all this? Veerbhadra turned towards Kali. Your Highness, is that it? Is this all we have to do? Uncover this road and keep walking, and we find the city of the Nagas. Kali grinned. If only life was that simple. The first prahar was just about ending. The sun glimmered over the horizon. Within a few minutes, it would be shining down in all its glory, spreading light and warmth. In the dense Sundarban, however, the sun was a shadow of its fiery self. Only a few rays courageously penetrated the heavy foliage to light the pathway for Shiva's convoy. A company of men had been stationed at the clearing, made by hacking the bushes up to the Naga road, with express instructions. Kill anything and everything emerging from the forest. The foot soldiers marched through the clearing, entering the Naga road with wonder in their eyes. The last thing they had expected was a comfortable and secure road through the forest. The procession was flanked by mounted riders, bearing torches, lighting the way. Riding a black horse, Vishwadimna was at the head, accompanied by Parvateshwar, Bhagirath and Anandmai. The Nilkant's family travelled in the centre, along with Kali, Ayurvati, Kritika and Nandi. Ganesh was at the clearing with Virbhadra and Parshuram. He would wait till every soldier had passed through. He had a task to do. Do we really need a rear guard, Ganesh? asked Virbhadra. It is almost impossible to find the floating Sundari grove. We are Nagas. Everyone hates us. We can never be too careful. That is the last of the soldiers. What now? Please guard me, said Ganesh. Ganesh walked into the clearing bearing a bag of seeds. Veerbhadra and Parshuram walked alongside, their weapons drawn, protecting his right and left flank. They had been in the clearing for a few moments when a wild boar sauntered in. It was the largest boar Veerbhadra had ever seen. The animal stopped at a distance, staring at the humans shuffling its front hoof, snorting softly. Parshuram turned to Ganesh. The animal was obviously gearing up to charge. The Naga continued to perform the task of scattering seeds onto the ground as he nodded softly. Parshuram lunged and swung hard with his axe, cutting the boar's head off in one clean sweep. Veerbhadra was edging forward to help Parshuram when Ganesh stopped him sharply. You keep your eyes focused on the other side, Veerbhadra. Parshuram is capable of handling this. Parshuram, meanwhile, continued to hack the beast's body. He then pulled the fragmented parts of the boar's corpse onto the road. As Parshuram walked back, he explained to Veerbhadra, That carcass will only attract other carnivores. Ganesh, meanwhile, had finished scattering all the seeds. He turned and walked back to the road, followed by Parshuram and Veerbhadra. As soon as they entered the road, Veerbhadra spoke up. That was one massive boar. Actually, that one was pretty small since it was young, said Ganesh. Others in this pack would be much larger. You don't want it to be close when we are defending the road. A sounder of boars in this region can be vicious. 
Veerbhadra turned and looked at the hundred Branga soldiers waiting for them, holding their horses steady. He turned to Ganesh. What now? Now we wait, said Ganesh, drawing his sword, his voice calm. We have to protect this gateway till tomorrow morning. Kill everything that tries to enter. Only till tomorrow? Those bushes will not be full grown by then. Oh yes, they will. Veerbhadra was woken up by the loud snarls of a tiger. Some animal, perhaps a deer, had fallen victim to the mighty cat. He looked around. The jungle was waking up. The sun had just risen. Fifty soldiers were sleeping in front of him. Beyond them was the Naga road on which Shiva's entourage had left the previous day. Veerbhadra pulled his Angavastram clothes around himself, breathing hard onto his hands. It was cold. He saw Parshuram next to him, sleeping soundly, snoring, his mouth slightly open. Veerbhadra raised himself on his elbows and turned around. The other fifty soldiers were standing guard, their swords drawn. They had taken over from their fellow soldiers at midnight. Ganesh? Out here, Veerbhadra, said Ganesh. Veerbhadra walked forward as the guards parted to reveal the lord of the people. Veerbhadra was stunned. By the holy lake, said Veerbhadra. The bushes have grown back completely. It's almost as if they had never been cut. The road is protected completely now. We can ride out. Half a day's hard riding and we will catch up with the rest. Then what are we waiting for? You should ask him, said Veerbhadra to Krithika. It had been a month of uneventful marching through the Sundarban. Despite the mammoth size of the convoy, they were making good progress. Krithika had slipped back from the center of the convoy to ride with her husband at the rear. She was enjoying her conversations with Ganesh and had grown increasingly fond of the elder son of her mistress. Ganesh, whose horse was keeping pace with Virbhadra's and Krithika's, turned. Ask me what? Well said Kritika. Veerabhadra tells me that you weren't too surprised to hear that Emperor Daksha may have killed Lord Chandandwaj. Parshuram pulled his horse up to fall in line with the others, curious. Did you know? asked Kritika. Yes. Kritika stared hard at Ganesh's face, trying to glean some traces of hate and anger. There were none. Do you not feel the need for vengeance? A sense of injustice? I feel no need for vengeance or justice, Kritika, said Ganesh. Justice exists for the good of the universe, to maintain balance. It does not exist to ignite hatred in humans. Furthermore, I do not have the power to administer justice to the emperor of Maluha. The universe does. It will deliver justice when it is appropriate, in this life or in the next. Parshuram interjected. But wouldn't vengeance make you feel better? You got your vengeance, didn't you? Asked Ganesh to Parshuram. Did you really feel better? Parshuram took a deep breath. He didn't. So you don't want anything to be done to Daksha? Asked Veerbhadra. Ganesh narrowed his eyes. I simply don't care. Veerbhadra smiled. Parshuram frowned at Veerbhadra's reaction. What? Asked Parshuram. Nothing much, said Veerbhadra. Just that I finally understood something Shiva had once told me, that the opposite of love is not hate. Hate is just love gone bad. The actual opposite of love is apathy, when you don't care a damn as to what happens to the other person. The food is delicious, said Shiva, smiling. It had been two months since Shiva's men had marched out of the floating Sundari grove. They had just entered the dreaded Dandak forests. The road had ended in a giant clearing, capable of accommodating many more than Shiva's band of traveling men. As was the Naga custom, groups of people were eating their dinner together on giant plates. Kali smiled. The forest has everything that we need. Sati patted Ganesh on the back. He rode separately from the rest of the family. So Sati enjoyed the common dinners where she got to talk to her elder son. Is the food all right? 
perfect, ma," smiled Ganesh. Ganesh turned to Karthik and slipped a mango to his younger brother. Karthik, who rarely smiled these days, looked at his elder brother with affection. "Thank you, Dada." Bhagirath looked up at Kali. He couldn't contain himself any longer. Your Highness, why are there five roads leading out of this clearing? I was wondering how you had kept yourself from asking that question till now. Everyone turned to Kali. Simple. Four of those paths lead you deeper and deeper into the Dandak, to your doom. Which path is the right one? Asked Bagirath. I will tell you tomorrow morning, when we leave. How many such clearings are there, Kali? Asked Shiva. Kali's lips drew in a broad smile. There are five such clearings on the way to Panchavati, Shiva. Lord Ram, be merciful," said Parvateshwar. "That means there is only a one in three thousand chance of marching down the right path to Panchavati." Yes," smiled Kali. Anand Mai was grinning. "Well, we better hope you don't forget the right path, Your Highness." Kali smiled. "Trust me, I won't." Kali looked at Shiva, Sati, and Nandi riding a little ahead of her. Shiva had just said something which made Sati and Nandi crack up in laughter. Then the Nilkanth turned to Nandi and winked. Kali turned to Ayurathi. He has the gift. They were marching at the center of the convoy to Panchavati. It had been three months since the march from the Madhumati River. Deep in the Dandak now. The march had been surprisingly uneventful and probably a little tedious. Conversations were the only relief from the boredom. What gift? Asked Ayurvati. Of bringing peace to people, drawing out their unhappiness. Said Kali. That he does. Said Ayurvati. But it is one of his many gifts. Om Namah Shivaya. Kali was surprised. The Meluhan doctor had just corrupted an old mantra. The words Om and Namaha were only added to the names of the old gods, never living men. The queen of the Nagas turned to gaze at Shiva riding ahead, and smiled. Sometimes simple faith could lead to profound peace. Kali repeated Ayurvati's line. Om Namah Shivaya. The universe bows to Lord Shiva. I bow to Lord Shiva. Ayurvati turned towards Karthik, riding a little behind. The boy, a few months older than four, looked like a nine-year-old. He presented a disturbing sight. Scars were visible on his arms and face. Two long swords tied in a cross across his back. No sign of a shield. His eyes were focused beyond the fence, searching for threats. Karthik had become withdrawn after the day his elder brother had saved him single-handedly from the lions, nearly dying in the process. He rarely spoke except to his parents, Kritika and Ganesh. He almost never smiled. He always accompanied hunting parties into the jungle. Many a times he had brought down animals single-handedly. Odd soldiers had given Ayurvati graphic details of Karthik moving in for the kill. Quiet. Focused and ruthless, Ayurvati sighed. Kali, who had developed a strong bond with Ayurvati over the months since they had left Kashi, whispered, "I think you should be happy. He has taken the right lessons from life. He is a child," said Ayurvati. "He has many years to go before he grows up. Who are we to decide when it is time for him to grow up?" said Kali. "The choice belongs to him." He will make all of us proud one day. It had been eight months since the march from the banks of the Madhumati. The convoy was only a day away from the Naga capital Panchvati. They were camped near the road, next to a mighty river as big as the Saraswati in its early reaches. Bagira thought that this great river must be the fabled Narmada. The border mandated by Lord Manu that was never to be crossed. They were on the northern side of the river. This must be the Narmada," said Bhagirath to Vishwadhyumna. "I guess we'll cross over tomorrow. Lord Manu, have mercy on us." Parvateshwar spoke up. "It must be. 
Narmada is the only river in the southern regions as enormous as the mighty Saraswati. Vishwadimna smiled. They were already far south of the Narmada. My lords, sometimes the mind makes you believe what you want to believe. Look again. There is no need to cross this river. Anandmai's eyes widened in surprise. By the great Lord Rutra, this river flows west to east. Vishwadimna nodded. That it does, your highness. This couldn't be the Narmada. That river was known to flow east to west. Lord Ram be merciful, cried Bhagirath. How can the existence of such a wide river be a secret? This entire land is a secret, my lord, said Vishwadimna. This is the Godavari, and you should see how much bigger it gets by the time it reaches the eastern sea. Parvateshwar stared in awe. He put his hands together and bowed to the flowing waters. The Godavari is not the only one, said Vishwadimna. I have heard rumors of other such giant rivers further south. Bhagirath looked at Vishwadimna, wondering what further surprises lay ahead the next day. Ganesh, said Nandi. Yes, Major Nandi, said Ganesh. Nandi had slipped back to the end of the caravan to relay a message from Kali to Ganesh. The Naga outposts will follow their standard practice vis-à-vis -vis the convoy, irrespective of the fact that the Queen and the Lord of the people travel with it. Queen Kali, ever cautious when it came to the welfare of her people, was indirectly referring to the fact that the progress of the convoy would now be monitored all the way to the Naga capital, so that any potential threats could be neutralized. Ganesh nodded. Thank you, Major. Nandi looked back at the small Naga outpost that they had just passed. What security can a hundred men provide, Ganesh? They are isolated, a day's journey from the city. The outpost is not even fortified properly. Seeing all the elaborate security measures the Nagas have in place, most of them bordering on genius, this one makes no sense. Ganesh smiled. He would normally not have trusted any non-Naga with details of their security. But this was Nandi, Shiva's shadow. Doubting him was like doubting the Nilkant himself. They cannot offer much protection on the road. But if there is such an attack, they trigger an early warning. Their key task then is to set booby traps along the way to Panchavati as they fall back towards the city. Nandi frowned. An outpost just to set booby traps? But that is not their primary task, continued Ganesh, pointing with his finger. Their key function is to protect us from a river attack. Nandi looked at the Godavari. Of course. It must meet the eastern sea somewhere, an opening that could be exploited. The Nagas truly thought of everything. The faint light of the full moon, breaking through the dense foliage intermittently, had lulled the creatures of the Dandak into a false sense of security. All was quiet in Shiva's camp, everyone fast asleep. Most had been awake till late into the night, eagerly discussing the end of their long and surprisingly uneventful journey through the dangerous woods of Sundarban and Dandak. Panchavati was only a day away. Suddenly, the quiet of the night was broken by the shrill call of a loud conch shell. Actually, many shells. Kali, at the center of the huge encampment, was up immediately, as were Shiva, Sati and Karthik. What the hell is that? shouted Shiva over the din. Kali was looking towards the river, stunned. This had never happened before. She turned back towards Shiva, teeth bared. Your men have betrayed us. The entire camp was up as the conch shells kept persistently sounding out their warning. Ganesh, closest to the blaring conches at the camp and nearest to the river, was making a beeline for it, Nandi, Virbhadra and Parshuram in tow. What is going on? screamed Virbhadra to make himself heard over the din. Enemy ships are sailing up to Godavari, shouted Ganesh. They have tripped our river warning system. What now? yelled Nandi. To the outpost. We have devil boats. Nandi turned around and relayed out the order to the three hundred men who had already rallied around to face the unknown threat. The soldiers had been following close on the heels of the four men. 
they doubled back to the outpost, where the hundred Naga men were already pushing out their devil boats. Meanwhile, Vishwadyumna, at the end farthermost from the enemy threat, rapidly controlled his disbelief and started carrying out the standard drill set in place for such an eventuality. A red flame was lit, warning Panchvati in the distance. Meanwhile, Bhagirath ran up to Vishwadyumna. What are your river defenses? Vishwadyumna glared angrily at Bhagirath, refusing to answer. He was sure the Nagas had been betrayed. Bhagirath shook his head and ran to Parvateshwar, who was already gathering soldiers and deploying them in defensive formations along the river. Any news? asked Parvateshwar. He won't talk, Parvateshwar! screamed Bhagirath. My fears have come true. They have betrayed us. We walk straight into a trap. Parvateshwar clenched his fists, looking at the five hundred men arrayed behind him in battle formation. Kill everything that emerges from that river. And then the sky lit up, ablaze at a thousand points. Bhagirath looked up. Lord Ram, be merciful. A shower of fiery arrows flew high. They had obviously been fired from a distance, from the battleships racing up the Godavari. Shields up! screamed Parvateshwar. At the center, Shiva and Kali had issued similar orders. Soldiers ducked under their shields, waiting for the onslaught of flaming arrows to stop. But scores of arrows had already found their targets, setting clothes on fire and piercing through many bodies, injuring large numbers and killing some unfortunate ones. There was no respite. The curtain of arrows kept raining down in an almost continuous shower. One arrow hit Ayurvati's leg. She screamed in pain, folding her leg closer to her body, holding her shield nearer. The sudden attack and its severity had forced most of Shiva's camp to cower behind their shields. But real fighting was on at the river end of the campsite, within the Godavari itself. Quickly! screamed Ganesh. If the downpour of arrows continued for a few more minutes, the entire camp would be destroyed. He had to move fast. His soldiers, the Suryavanshis, Chandravanshis and the Nagas were swimming hard, pushing the hundred small boats towards the five large ships, rowing rapidly up the Godavari. The small boats, with dried firewood and a small flint inside, had been covered by a thick cloth. Once in range, the devil boats would be lit and rammed into the ships. Fire was the best way to destroy such large wooden ships. The ships were sailing upriver rapidly, the flaming arrows still being continuously shot from their decks. Due to the manic speed of the vessels coming towards them, Ganesha's soldiers didn't have to swim too far to reach the enemy battleships. The devil boats were already in place, aligned to ram into them. Light them! screamed Ganesh. Soldiers rapidly pulled the cloth off each boat and struck the flints. The boats were aflame almost instantaneously, before the assassins on any ship could react. Ganesha's men pushed the boats into the sides of the ships. Hold them in place, screamed Dandi. The ships have to catch fire. The lookout assassins on the ships turned their bows onto the attackers in the water. A hailstorm of arrows started tearing into the brave soldiers in the river, maiming and killing many. The fire from the devil boats was also lapping Ganesha's men. But they grimly kept swimming, pushing the boats onto the ships. All five ships were aflame within moments, but the loss of life till they had caught fire made it seem like an eternity. Back to the shore! screamed Ganesh. He knew he had to form his line on the Godavari's banks now. As fire spread through the ships, the assassins would jump over or into lifeboats and row up to the shores to resume battle. Ganesh's soldiers had barely made it to the riverbanks when they heard a deafening blast. They turned around in shock. The first ship of the enemy fleet had just blown up. Within a few moments, the other ships went up in gigantic explosions as well. Ganesh turned to Parshuram, stunned. Devi Astras? Parshuram nodded, shocked out of his wits. Only divine weapons could have led to such explosions. But how could anyone lay their hands on such weapons, and that too in such alarming quantities? Ganesh rallied his men, counting the living. He had lost one hundred of the valiant four hundred who had charged behind him, mostly Nagas, the only ones who knew the drill. 
the lord of the people gritted his teeth in anger and marched towards the camp to find Kali and Shiva. You led us into a trap! A livid Parvateshwar screamed. He had lost twenty men in the hail of arrows. The number of dead in the camp center was significantly higher. Close to fifty soldiers had been killed. The highest casualties were, of course, at the end closest to the enemy warships. Three hundred soldiers had died there, including the hundred that were killed while attacking the enemy ships. Ayurvati, with a broken shaft buried in her thigh, was rushing around with her medics, trying to save as many as she could. Nonsense! yelled Kali. You betrayed us. Nobody has ever attacked us from the Godavari. Ever! Quiet! shouted Shiva. He turned to Veerbhadra, Parshuram, Nandi and Ganesh, who had just arrived. What were those explosions, Parshuram? Daivi Astras, my lord, said Parshuram. The five enemy ships were carrying them. The fires triggered the explosions. Shiva breathed deeply, staring into the distance. My lord, said Bhagirath. Turn back now. More traps await us on the way and at Panchavati. There are only two Nagas here. Think of what a fifty thousand could do. Kali exploded. This is your doing. Panchavati has never been attacked. You let your cohorts here. It was lucky that Ganesh led a fight back and decimated your troops. Otherwise, we all would have been slaughtered. Sati touched Kali lightly. She wanted to point out that even Suryavanshi and Chandravanshi men fighting alongside Ganesh had been killed. Enough! shouted Shiva. Don't any of you get what really happened? The Nilkant turned towards Nandi and Karthik. Take a hundred men and go downriver. See if there are any survivors from the enemy ships. I want to know who they were. Nandi and Karthik left immediately. Shiva looked at the people around him, seething. We were all betrayed. Whosoever was firing those arrows was not picking and choosing targets. They wanted us all dead. But how did they come up the Godavari? Asked Kali. Shiva glared at her. How the hell should I know? Most people here didn't even know this river wasn't the Narmada. It has to be the Nagas, my lord, said Bhagirath. They cannot be trusted. Sure, said Shiva sarcastically. The Nagas sprung this trap to kill their own queen. And then Ganesh led a counter-attack on his own people and blew them up with Deviastras. If he had Deviastras and wanted us dead, why didn't he just use the weapons on us? Pin dropped silence. I think the Astras were meant to destroy Panchavati. They planned to slaughter us easily from their ships and then sail up to the Naga capital and destroy it as well. What they didn't bet on was the Naga wariness and extensive security measures, including the devil boats. That saved us. What the Nilkant was saying made sense. Ganesh thanked Bhumi Devi silently that the Naga Rajya Sabha had agreed to his proposal of arming the banks of the Godavari outpost with devil boats for any such eventuality. Someone wants us all dead, said Shiva. Someone powerful enough to get such a large arsenal of Devi Astras. Someone who knows about the existence of such a huge river in the south and has the ability to identify its sea route. Someone resourceful enough to get a fleet of ships with enough soldiers to attack us. Who is that person? That is the question. The sun was rising slowly over the horizon, spreading light and warmth over the tired camp. A relief party from Panchvati had just arrived with food and medical supplies. Ayurvati had finally relented and was resting in a medical tent after having been assured that most of the injured were taken care of. The death toll had not risen further as the night had progressed. Even those with nearly fatal injuries had been saved. Karthik and Nandi trooped into the camp after the night-long search along the river and went straight up to Shiva. Karthik spoke first. There are no survivors, Baba. My lord, we checked both the river banks. Nandi added. Went through all the wreckage. Even rode five kilometers downriver. 
in case some survivors had been washed off, but we found no one alive. Shiva cursed silently. He suspected who the attackers were, but wasn't certain. He called Parvateshwar and Bhagirath. Both of you recognize the ships in your respective countries. I want you to study the wrecks properly. I want to know if any of those ships were Meluhan or Swadvipan. My lord, cried Parvateshwar. It cannot be. Parvateshwar, please, do this for me, interrupted Shiva. I want an honest answer. Where did those goddamn ships come from? Parvateshwar saluted the Nilkant. As you command, my lord. The Meluhan general left, followed by Bhagirath. You think it's a coincidence that this attack happened just one day before you were to discover the secret? Shiva and Sati were sitting in a semi-secluded area along the river near the camp. It was the last hour of the first prahar. The cremation ceremonies had been completed. Though the injured were in no state to travel, the general consensus was that reaching the safety of Panchavati was imperative. The Naga city offered better protection than an indefensible forest road. The Nagas had arranged carts to carry the injured in the convoy to their capital and were scheduled to leave within the hour. I can't say, said Shiva. Sati remained quiet, looking into the distance. You think uh, that your father could be... Sati sighed. After all that I have learnt of him recently... I would not put it past him. Shiva reached out and held Sati. But I don't think he can order an attack of this magnitude by himself. Continued Sati. He doesn't have the capability. Who is the master puppeteer and why is he doing this? Shiva nodded. That is the mystery. But first, I need to know this big secret. I have a feeling the answers could be deeply connected with all that is going on in Meluha, Swadweep and Panchwati. The sun was high when the entourage, bloodied and tired, marched up the riverbanks of the Godavari to the Naga capital, Panchwati, the land of the five banyan trees. These weren't just any odd five banyans. Their legend had begun more than a thousand years ago. These were the trees under which the seventh Vishnu, Ram, accompanied by his wife Sita and brother Lakshman, had rested during their exile from Ayodhya. They had set up house close to these trees. This was also the unfortunate place from where the demon king Ravan had kidnapped Sita, triggering a war with Ram. That war destroyed Ravan's glittering and obscenely rich kingdom of Lanka. Panchavati was situated on the northeastern banks of the Godavari. The river flowed down from the mountains of the western Ghats towards the eastern sea. To the west of Panchavati, the river took a strange 90 degree turn to the south, flowed straight down for a little less than a kilometer and then turned east once again to continue its journey to the sea. This turn of the Godavari allowed the Nagas to build grand canals and used this cleared part of the Dandak to meet the agricultural needs of their citizens. To the surprise of the Suryavanshis, Panchvati was built on a raised platform, much like the cities of Meluha. Strong walls of cut stone rose high, with turrets at regular intervals to defend against invaders. The area around the walls, extending a long distance, was used by Nagas for agricultural purposes. There was also a comfortable colony of guest houses set up for regular Branga visitors. A second wall surrounded these lands. Beyond the second wall, land was again cleared far and wide to give a clear line of sight of approaching enemies. Panchavati had been established by Bhumi Devi. The mysterious non-Naga lady had instituted the present way of life of the Nagas. Nobody knew the antecedents of Bhumi Devi, and she had strictly forbidden any image of hers from being recorded. Hence, the only memories of the founder of the present Naga civilization were her laws and statements. The city of Panchvati was the epitome of her way of life, 
combining the best of the Suryavanshis and the Chandavanshis. It loudly proclaimed her aspiration above the city gates. Satyam Sundaram Truth Beauty Shiva's convoy was allowed entry from the outer gates and led straight to the Branga guest quarters. Each member of the convoy was assigned comfortable rooms. Why don't you relax, Shiva? said Kali. I will bring the secret out. I want to go into Panchavati now, said Shiva. Are you sure? Aren't you tired? Of course I am tired, but I need to see the secret right now. All right. While Shiva's company waited outside in the guest house, Kali and Ganesh led Shiva and Sati into the city. The city was nothing like they had expected. It had been laid out in a neat grid-like pattern, much like Miluhan cities. But the Nagas appeared to have taken the Suryavanshi ideal of justice and equality to its logical extreme. Every single house, including that of the queen, was of exactly the same design and size. There were no poor or rich among the 50,000 Nagas who lived there. Does everyone live the same way in Panchavati? Sati asked Ganesh. Of course not, Ma. Everyone has a right to decide what they want to do with their lives. But the state provides housing and basic necessities. And in that, there is complete equality. Practically all the inhabitants had lined up outside their houses to see the Nilkant walk by. They had heard of the mysterious attack on the Nilkant's convoy. The people were thanking Bhumi Devi that nothing had happened to their queen or the lord of the people. Shiva was shocked to see that many people did not have any deformities. He saw many of them cradling Naga babies in their arms. What are these non-Nagas doing in Panchavati? asked Shiva. They are parents of Naga children, said Kali. And they live here? Some parents abandon their Naga children said Kali. And some feel a strong bond with their progeny, strong enough to overcome their fear of societal prejudices. We give refuge to such people in Panchavati. Who takes care of Naga babies whose parents abandon them? asked Sati. Childless Nagas, said Kali. Nagas cannot have natural children, so they readily adopt the abandoned children from Eluhan's Vadweep and bring them up as their own with the love and attention that is the birthright of every child. They walked in silence to the city centre. It was here, around the five legendary banyan trees, that all the communal buildings were situated. These edifices, to be used by all the residents of Panchavati, had been built in the grand style of Swadweepan buildings. There was a school, a temple dedicated to Lord Rudra and Lady Mohini, a public bath, and a stadium for performances where the 50,000 citizens met regularly. Music, dance and drama were coveted lifestyle choices and not paths to knowledge. Where is the secret? asked Shiva, getting impatient. In here, Lord Nilkant, said Ganesh, pointing to the school. Shiva frowned. A secret in a school? He expected it to be in the spiritual center of the city. The temple of Lord Rudra. He walked towards the building. The rest followed. The school had been built in traditional style around an open courtyard. A colonnaded corridor ran along the courtyard with doors leading into the classrooms. At the far end was a large open room. The library. Along the side of the library was another large corridor leading to the playground beyond the main building. On the other side of the ground were the other facilities such as halls and practice laboratories. Please keep quiet, said Kali. The classes are still on. We would like to disturb only one class and not all of them. We will disturb none, said Shiva, walking towards the library, where he expected the secret of the Nagas to be. Perhaps a book? Lord Nilkant, said Ganesh, halting Shiva mid-stride. Shiva stopped. Ganesh pointed to the curtained entrance of a classroom. Shiva frowned. An oddly familiar voice was expounding philosophies. The voice was crystal clear behind the curtain. New philosophies today blame desire for everything. 
Desire is the root cause for all suffering, all destruction, right? Yes, Guruji, said a student. Please explain, said the teacher. Because desire creates attachment, attachment to this world. And when you don't get what you want or get what you don't want, it leads to suffering. This leads to anger and that to violence and wars, which finally results in destruction. So, if you want to avoid destruction and suffering, you should control your desires, right? Asked the teacher. Give up Maya, the illusion of this world. Shiva, from the other side of the curtain, answered silently, Yes. But the Rig Veda, one of our main sources of philosophy, continued the teacher, says that in the beginning of time, there was nothing except darkness and a primordial flood. Then out of this darkness, desire was born. Desire was the primal seed, the germ of creation. And from here, we all know that the Prajapati, the lord of the creatures, created the universe and everything in it. So in a sense, desire is the root of creation as well. Shiva was mesmerized by the voice on the other side of the curtain. Good point. How can desire be the source of creation as well as destruction? The students were quiet, stumped for answers. Think about this in another way. Is it possible to destroy anything that has not been created? No, Guruji. On the other hand, is it safe to assume that anything that has been created has to be destroyed at some point in time? Yes, answered a student. That is the purpose of desire. It is for creation and destruction. It is the beginning and the end of a journey. Without desire, there is nothing. Shiva smiled. There must be a Vasudev Pandit in that room. The Nilkant turned to Kali. Let's go to the library. I want to read the secret. I will meet Panditji later. Kali held Shiva. The secret is not a thing. It is a man. Shiva was taken aback, his eyes wide with surprise. Ganesh pointed at the curtained entrance to the classroom. And he waits for you in there. Shiva stared at Ganesh, immobilized. The Lord of the People gently drew the curtain aside. Guruji, please forgive the interruption. Lord Nilkant is here. Then Ganesh stepped aside. Shiva entered and was immediately stunned by what he saw. What the hell? He turned to Ganesh, bewildered. The Lord of the People smiled softly. The Nilkant turned back to the teacher. I have been waiting for you, my friend, said the teacher. He was smiling, his eyes moist. I told you, I would go anywhere for you, even to Patal Lok if it would help you. Shiva had rerun this line in his mind again and again, never fully understanding the reference to the land of the demons. Now, it all clicked into place. The beard had been shaved off, replaced by a pencil-thin moustache. The broad shoulders and barrel chest, earlier hidden behind a slight layer of fat, had been honed through regular exercise. The janeu, the string signifying Brahmin antecedents, traced a path over newly developed rippling muscles. The head remained shaved, but the tuft of hair at the back of his head appeared longer and better oiled. The deep-set eyes had the same serenity that had drawn Shiva to him earlier. It was his long-lost friend, his comrade-in-arms, his brother. Brihaspati, 